Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend. The DN What If, with another fanfiction. This is the movie of, What If Deku Was a Sniper. All credits for this video go to their respective authors, so please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. He didn't exactly plan on becoming a vigilante, it just kind of happened. Maybe it was from the constant aggression Katsuki Bakugo always treated him with, or a determination to prove that someone with his quirk could excel as a combat hero. And so, he transformed into the elusive vigilante known as Zero, a figure whose notoriety spread far and wide. Despite the widespread awareness of his existence, Zero remained an enigma, outsmarting the police at every turn. No leads, no names, no accomplices Zero left no trace of his presence, creating a difficult challenge for law enforcement. Even the most logical assumptions about his sniping posts or whereabouts proved futile, as Zero operated from locations far removed from conventional expectations. Izuku had steadily enhanced his strength by clearing beach trash for months and crafting his own gear from salvaged parts. Despite the police's efforts to trace firearms back to him, he leaves no leads and no explanations as to how and where he got all of his weapons. Things were peaceful at first, police cases were light, giving them more time with their families, and villains were taken down quickly from wherever Zero would strike from. But then, police found the criminals with more extensive injuries and wounds, some even needing to be hospitalized, which meant that they were back to focusing on Zero's case again. He might have been going easy on them for the first four years, until his attacks started to get more violent. Instead of the common attacks from the distance, Zero has been engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They even called in the help of Eraserhead, given that he was an underground pro who specialized in this kind of stuff. But even then, Zero still managed to slip through his fingers every time. Eraserhead was lucky enough to see Zero's silhouette when he ran away. He had the skill that a pro hero possessed and spontaneously decided that he was a man in his twenties because of how agile he was. Never even considering the fact that he could be a child. Izuku had started hunting the man who killed his mother. He was there when it happened and could tell that it was an accident. But that didn't have the fact that she was gone because the heroes didn't put the civilians first. He was forced to leave his home and live on his own to drop out of school when he couldn't pay the tuition. Probably best that way. He didn't know if he could handle the bullying after the death of his mother. Izuku changed. Instead of the happy hero fanboy he once was, he was now full of hate for heroes and out for vengeance. He was getting more sloppy with his ambushes too, leaving all kinds of clues for the police to find. Eraserhead knew the signs of that though. Something happened to their vigilante and he was going to find out what. Izuku slipped on his fingerless dark green gloves, flipping up the hood of his costume and pulling the extra fabric from his neck to cover the bottom half of his face, leaving only his dull green eyes visible. He opened the case where parts of Blackout were tucked safely inside and started to assemble the lethal weapon, transferring it into another case. He grasped his combat belt from the desk next to the nest of blankets and pillows he considered a bed. Honestly, it was pretty comfy. He made sure his knives, grenades, bow staff, and varieties of bullets were fully stocked before strapping it over his dark green costume. After pulling up his shin and knee guards, he slipped on the tall leather black combat boots and grabbed the case and his grappling hook. Zero tugged the window next to him open and fired the gun at a nearby building and flew up to the roof. Tonight was the night. He was going to find his mother's killer tonight. His eyes narrowed at the thought. His pockets may be filled with different kinds of bullets that no one had ever thought could be made, but they were also packed with real bullets that were made to kill, and that was what filled his magazine tonight. He reeled in the grappling hook again and fell back off the tall building, free-falling for a few seconds before shooting his arm out and firing the gun again. The hook secured itself onto another building and Zero swung through the crisp air of the bright city keeping an eye out for any petty criminals or villains, even though he could see heroes patrolling. He was high enough that they wouldn't notice his presence, 
as he kept flying through the air. Zero had gotten more skilled with not only his sniping skills to the point where he never misses and his healing skills over the four years that he was doing vigilantism, and would still help anyone in the hospital every now and again. Sure, he couldn't regrow any organs or limbs that were lost, but he could make it so that they could get out of the hospital faster. He still helped people but hardly showed any mercy to his targets. The vigilante reeled in the grappling hook again and flipped like a professional gymnast onto a roof and elongated the bow staff before jumping down onto a mugger who was trying to take a woman's purse. Seeing him, the criminal jumped back when Zero swung his weapon to his head. He landed in a silent crouch in front of the crying woman, glaring at the man. He slightly paled when Zero stood, spinning the weapon in his hands, and attacked without hesitation. The man backtracked to the entrance of the alley and Zero's staff hit the ground instead. He jumped off the brick walls, tackling the man and punching him until he passed out. Zero took out the zip ties in his pouch and tied the man's wrists and ankles together. After he was secured, he gathered the scattered belongings back into the light brown purse and put his staff away as he walked back to the weeping woman. He put a gloved hand on her shoulder and handed her the purse. Her hands trembled as she took the purse back and hugged it to her chest. Zero took her hand and pulled her up. Th thank you, she said quickly and Zero nodded, walking back to the man and shooting the hook out. He grabbed the back of the man's shirt and shot into the sky. Izuku sat on a building with a leg dangling off the side and eating the rice balls he made beforehand while staring at old articles of heroes. One in particular. Zepter. The blade hero is known for the sharp blades that protrude from any part of his body. His eyes darkened from the memory. He had been patrolling that night when he spotted a villain attack in the distance and arrived just in time for Zepter to stab his mother when the villain used her as a shield. He just stopped. Izuku didn't think about anything as he watched the villain toss his mother away just watching her limp body, waiting for her to move, but she never did. Tears had soaked his mask as he turned to the fight. Zepter's face was pale with shock and horror as he stared at the green-haired woman. Zero's first thought was to shoot the hero right then and there. But the villain was terrorizing the civilians still, so he put aside his feelings and drew black out from its case and lay on the roof, steadying the stands on the edge and closed a low-powered taser bullet in the capsule of the gun. He squished his face against the cold metal and lined his eye into the scope. The villain was able to control water, lashing out at the people with water-encased arms, making the low-powered bullet the right choice in this scenario. A high-powered one could most likely fry his brain since water and electricity didn't mesh well together. He lined the bullet up to the middle of his back and waited for him to start turning before he pulled the trigger. The gun fired with a loud boom, almost as loud as Katsuki's explosions and hit the villain square in the chest. He convulsed and the water fell to the street. Everyone was in shock at the sudden attack and Zero pulled his sniper over the side before their eyes could land on him. When he looked back over the ledge, Zero watched the heroes grab the villain and pull him into the back of a transport vehicle and his eyes followed Zepter as he stumbled over to the woman he had unintentionally stabbed and checked her pulse. But Izuku already knew that she was gone. He dragged his mask down his neck and threw up. Tears mixed into the green and brown pile of vomit as he sobbed. His mother was gone, and he never got to apologize for what he said that night. They had gotten into a huge argument hours before, leaving Izuku to walk out of the house with his gear. The things that were said. Izuku clutched his chest, the sirens of police cars and ambulances drowning out the sound of his screams. Inko Midoriya died. Thinking that her son hated her, Izuku blinked the memory away, wiping at his face to get rid of the tears. Izuku used to be full of smiles and laughs. But that moment, just five seconds snapped something in him, and he just broke. Izuku hasn't felt anything for four years. He sat up with a sigh, rubbing his head. He stiffened when he saw a familiar hero walking down the empty street. Slowly, ever so slowly, Izuku pulled his mask back up his face and attached his fifteen knife to his lower back, 
and the long box of his sniper across his back and lowered himself to the ground behind Zepter, creeping up behind him and drawing his knife. He shook with years of rage and lunged with a yell. The hero spun around and a blade snapped out of his arm, blocking the attack, but Zero slashed out with another blade, scratching his cheek as Zepter jerked back. Zero didn't give him time to breathe as he attacked again. Zepter groaned when one of the vigilante's blades sunk into his stomach, not deep enough to fatally wound or hit any vital spots, but it still slowed him down when he tried to move out of the way. When he finally had the chance to attack, Zero spun out of the way and behind him, knocking him to the ground with the butt of his grappling gun. He sat astride his waist and brought the blade down towards his head with another yell, only for his wrist to come to a stop. Zero looked at the cloth around his wrist, then followed it towards a part of the darkest areas where red eyes shone through it. Aizawa huffed in annoyance and exhaustion when nothing was happening during his patrol again. Thanks to this city's notorious vigilante, crimes have dwindled. But he was still required to do this job instead of having a proper sleep schedule and seeing his husband outside of their teaching jobs. Just one more hour. One more and then I can go get at least three hours of sleep before teaching another incompetent class of students. He couldn't help the overwhelming feeling of shutting his eyes. He would have fallen asleep if a scream of pure anger hadn't rang through the once silent neighborhood. Aizawa shoved his yellow goggles over his eyes, and he swung towards the screen. His eyes widened, however, when he saw none other than the vigilante Zero attacking a pro hero. Not defending, attacking. He had gotten the chance to see the guy's masked face to know that this was him and due to the evidence. He had never shown any signs of aggression towards the innocent. Not even towards the villains and criminals that he always helped take down. Eraser had scarf flew out of the ally and wrapped around Zero's wrist just before he could shove that wicked black blade through Zepter's skull, making the kid on top of him look in his direction where his quirk was already activated. Zero's eyes widened when Eraser had stepped out. He flipped the nine dagger in his other hand and tried to drag it across Zepter's throat, and the other end of Eraser Head's capture scarf shot out and snagged onto that wrist too. Zer snarled with savage rage as the scarf twisted, making him drop his knives and eraser head jerked his arms. Zero flew towards the underground hero, who reached out to grab him, but with surprising agility, Zero flipped and tried to land behind him, but eraser head swung his leg out, kicking him down the street. Eraser head looked at the unconscious pro on the ground, and then at the kid in front of him. He couldn't tell from the distance, but when eraser head saw him running, he was too far away to judge how small he was, and he was small. His black hair fell back around his shoulders as Zero flipped to his feet, placing his case in front of him. The case snapped open, and the pro's eyes widened at the huge sniper pointed at him. Whatever bullet he had loaded into it seconds after he took it out was fired with a flash of orange and a bang. Eraser head was fast, but not fast enough to dodge a bullet, and thought that was it. But no. Instead of blinding pain that would have erupted from his chest, a net exploded from the bullet and tangled around him. He grunted when the air was knocked out of his lungs, and he saw Zero sprinting towards the rousing hero behind him. The racer head effortlessly sliced through the net with his knife, swiftly immobilizing Zero by wrapping his scarf around the vigilante's leg, sending him crashing to the ground. As Zepter fled in retreat, Eraserhead couldn't help but scoff at the supposed hero's lack of commitment. However, his attention returned to Zero, who emitted a wounded sound while revealing another concealed knife. Despite the injuries, Zero ignored Eraserhead and sprinted after Zepter. Perplexed by the vigilante's fixation on the escaping hero, Eraserhead pondered the situation. His contemplation was cut short when Zero, still grappling with his injuries, launched an attack from the air. Eraserhead reacted swiftly, grabbing Zo's foot and slamming him onto the ground. The pained cry that escaped Zero's lips hinted at his youthful age. Zero, seemingly unfazed, shifted his focus toward the fleeing Zepter. However, to his dismay, Zepter had vanished, leaving Zero distraught. As he whimpered in disappointment, Zer realized he had missed a crucial opportunity. 
In a desperate attempt to salvage the situation, Zero moved, ending up on top of a racer head. Strangely, instead of launching another assault, Zero merely placed his hands on a racer head's chest. A racer head, observing the agony and tears in Zero's eyes, grew suspicious. Zero, overcome with emotion, whispered about a missed chance. Suddenly, he twisted away, deploying his grappling hook to propel himself off a racer head. Snatching Blackout's case from the ground, Zero vanished into the shadows, leaving Eraserhead to figure out what the hell just happened. Two days later, Izuku sat on top of his favorite building, soaking in the orange and red sunset across the city with his head cushioned on the arms that were on the railing. He hadn't tried to find Zepter again. He hadn't done anything. Just lay in the pile of pillows and blankets in a daze before finally going out and getting some fresh air. He couldn't stop thinking about the fight with Eraserhead. Izuku may have lost his respect for the heroes, but Eraserhead was, he was one of his idols. Scratch that, he was his idol. It used to be All Might. But as he learned more about vigilantism, he studied the underground hero and named him his new favorite pro. He didn't bother pulling up his hood or mask, resisting the urge to place his hand on the sniper next to him when someone jumped onto the roof behind him. Footsteps walked up and stood beside him, hands in their pockets. His eyes shuddered at the all-black loose jumpsuit and a gray scarf around his neck. Aizawa stared at the sunset, taking in the view before getting a look at the kid who managed to evade the police and heroes for four years and had to reign in his shock. He was no older than twelve or thirteen, and he was out here as a vigilante. He took in the slightly chiseled cheekbones covered in freckles, his messy green hair, and lifeless matching eyes. Izuku let a bitter smile grow on his face. Come to arrest me, Eraserhead, he rasped. Aizawa sighed. No, I saw you up here and decided to try and talk to you. Although, I was expecting a chase. Izuku huffed. Sorry to disappoint. This is where I come to unwind. I love the view of the city from up here. The sun crept lower and lower over the horizon before disappearing, leaving a blue and purple-colored sky behind it. The kid's eyes closed. Now that you found out that I'm just a teenager, what are you going to do? Turn me in? Arrest me for attempted murder and vigilantism? The man leaned against the railing. None. I won't do anything, and not because I found out you were a kid. I just wanted to talk. He said calmly making Izuku chuckle. Fine, go ahead. I have time for a Q&A. He said, not taking his eyes off the brightening buildings. Aizawa softly said, How old are you? Thirteen, Izuku responded truthfully. I started building my own gear with the scraps and trash from the beach before I started cleaning as extra strength training. Then I got out into the field at ten, teaching myself how to fight and snipe. The man allowed a brief pause, waiting to see if Zero had more to share. Then he inquired, What's your quirk? Do you have a sharp shooting vision? A bitter smile crossed Zero's face as he responded. No, sniping was just a skill that I learned. My real quirk is healing-based, called Vitakinizes. I can heal almost any injury, except regrowing limbs and organs. I started doing this to show everyone that I could be strong. That your quirk doesn't determine what kind of hero you will be. That's why I admire you so much, he added, surprising Aizawa. Zero continued. There isn't a lot of info about you of course, but I know that your quirk is erasure, and you can erase someone's quirk with just a look. It's not combat-based, yet you still became what you are today, basically fighting quirkless the entire time. As Zero spoke, his smile softened revealing a more youthful and vulnerable side to his character. Aizawa couldn't help but be moved by the genuine admiration and connection Zero felt toward him. You're so cool, Eraserhead, Zero whispered in awe, the words more a reflection of his thoughts than an intended compliment. Aizawa couldn't help but feel a subtle uplift in his spirits at the unexpected praise. While Zero exuded confidence as a fighter, there was an underlying sense that this kid had witnessed and experienced far more than his bravado let on. Aizawa's lips twitched upward in a faint, appreciative smile, 
recognizing a unique blend of admiration and weariness in Zero's words. Why did you try to kill that man the other night? Izuku's eyes clouded over and his smile faded as he said quietly. He killed my mom. He said and Aizawa's breath hitched in his throat. Izuku's jaw clenched. There was a villain attack last year and Zepter was helping the others fight against the villain who could control water. When he tried to attack, the villain grabbed my mom and used her as a shield. His lip wobbled. Zepter's blades went inside her instead. He sniffled. We had gotten into an argument that night, making me storm out of the house like a baby having a temper tantrum. Izuku scoffed at himself. Mom got worried, so she came out to find me and was dragged into the attack. I went over to help them, but I only saw him run his blades through her. He sobbed, swiping his arm over his eyes. The things I said to her. My mom died thinking that I hated her. Aizawa winced as Izuku cried. He didn't know what to do with crying children. That was Hizashi's department. Izuku eventually calmed down. I lost my respect for heroes then. I used to be obsessed with finding information about anyone's quirks. I used to know who the heroes were off the top of my head. But now, I just resent every one of them. He looked at him, with wide eyes. Except you of course. I'm not sure why. I guess you're just immune to my hatred. Aizawa snorted at that. I'm honored. But I can tell you right now that killing him wouldn't have solved anything. You wouldn't feel any better. In fact, you would probably feel even worse. Killing isn't the right answer, no matter what excuses you have. He put a light hand on his shoulder, making Izuku look up. You have skills, kid. Skills that a pro has. That's why all of us thought you were in your twenties. I guess it worked out for you, though since it made them suspect you even less. Izuku closed his eyes with a smile. I've been very proud of myself for not being caught. He looked at him again. What else did you want to ask? This was it. This was why Aizawa initially came up here. Let's team up. After just two months of working together, they realized that they were a great team. While Izuku focused more on sniping from a distance, Aizawa took care of the close combat. Aizawa would have still managed well on his own, but working and seeing the kid every day brought him comfort. Ever since he found out that he was just a kid, he felt the need to protect him, even though he knew damn well that Izuku could take care of himself. He proved that much when they would spar together. Izuku became brave enough to finally show Aizawa where he was staying, and the adult wasn't very comfortable with a 14-year-old living like this, even if he kept insisting that the nest of blankets and pillows was comfortable. That's right, 14. Izuku had his birthday on July 15th. Somehow, Aizawa found out and bought him a little cake. He had tried to convince him that he could stay with him and his husband, but the small fighter was very stubborn, and now he knew another place where he could find Izuku if he ever wanted to see him off duty. What if you came to Yua? Aizawa had said suddenly one night, while they were walking down the street in full uniforms. Zero's masked face snapped to him. I'm a vigilante. I'm on the other side of the law. Isn't it a little late for me to become a hero? We have a rehabilitation program and kid, with your skills. I bet you could get your license and become a pro hero. Zero was startled at that. Me? A pro? I, I don't know. If you become a pro, then you have the authorization to engage in combat with the villains legally. He explained. No one knows what you look like in and out of the costume, so no one would recognize you. Zero bit his lip. He had wanted to be a hero since he was little. But I told you that I lost respect for heroes. Why would I want to become one? Will for one, you are already rescuing people like a hero. But you have been hurting the criminals, which is against the law for uncertified quirk users to use their quirks to hurt the villain. That had Zero raising an eyebrow. But I don't use my healing, I snipe and fight. To use my quirk, while I'm trying to apprehend the criminals would be counterproductive. He joked. Aizawa rolled his eyes at the kid. Zero suddenly stopped, looking out ahead of them. The man reached up to pull his goggles over his eyes when Zero knelt and snapped the clips of his sniper case. 
Eraserhead was amazed at the sheer speed that Zero demonstrated while assembling all of the parts. When he finished, he lay on the ground, balancing the lethal weapon on its stance. Eraserhead wasn't sure what he saw, because, to him, nothing was ahead of them. Zero reached back and pulled out a thick rubber yellow bullet, loading it into the capsule on the side, pulled the clip back, and waited. Eraserhead knew better than to ask what he was waiting for and just kneeled beside him. Then he was shocked when shouts sounded from the street around the block. Zero fired the gun at nothing, and then a man carrying a thick bag of jewels bolted around the corner. The bullet hit him square in the chest and he convulsed. Yellow lightning crackled around him. He dropped the bags and fell to the ground, while Eraserhead was trying not to gape stupidly. This kid was insane. Zero hummed with satisfaction and folded the stands underneath the gun so it fit better in the case. Izuku stood, wiping any dirt from his clothes, and walked towards the unconscious man. He pulled out his zip ties, strapping them to his wrists and ankles before suddenly jumping up the building. When more yells came from around the corner and sirens accompanied them, Eraserhead threw out his capture weapon and joined his partner on the roof. Police officers ran around the block and stopped when they saw the thief just lying there. But then they noticed the zip ties and the bullet that was still lodged into the man's chest. It was nuts that Zero's bullets wouldn't go through the target's body. But it would leave one hell of a bruise. Zero has been here. Look. The officer stuffed his hand through a plastic bag and grabbed the bullet. It's one of his paralysis bullets. Zero nudged the adult beside him jerking his head back. Eraserhead got the message, and they jumped away from the crime scene. Izuku blended in with the huge crowd, gathered beneath a bridge, listening to what the civilians were saying as a criminal with an enlarged quirk blocked off the rest of the road. A quirk like that, and he's just a petty thief. Got held up, the train's out, another villain. Izuku deadpanned at that. It was annoying to him that people couldn't tell the difference between a small-time criminal and a real villain. Criminals break the law just to get something that they want and villains are people who actually enjoy breaking the law. Some would call him one, but he was helping people. Breaking the law just couldn't be avoided for him. Girls were squealing as the new hero, Kamui Woods, swung overhead. In Izuku's opinion, he was being a little too dramatic with his job right now probably more focused on looking cool to the public. In a way, he understood that. New heroes always tried to make it memorable. But there was a thing of going a little too far when it came to ego. Izuku rolled his eyes when Kamui Woods addressed the criminal. Assault, robbery, and illegal use of powers during rush hour traffic. You are the incarnation of evil. Izuku scoffed at the absurdity and walked back down the street. He could hardly call that evil. Izuku had never seen evil, but he knew it was out there, and that was definitely not it. Izuku looked over his shoulder when an explosion boomed from a nearby alley. Another criminal. Seriously, was it so hard to just ask for a peaceful day? Just one. Curiosity got the best of him, and he crossed the street and joined the crowd. Many fires were spread out across the ground and burning posters and signs were on the wall. He sucked in a harsh breath. It was in fact another criminal, but this one had a hostage. His entire body was made of green sludge, making him look like he was from a sewer. Izuku's green eyes were wide, and he almost dropped the bags of groceries in his arms. He had encountered numerous hostage situations before, but those typically involved threats to life. This one was different. He was actually killing him. The criminal relentlessly pushed his sludge into the boy's airways, snuffing out his ability to breathe. However, the captive fought back tenaciously, setting off explosions in a desperate struggle for survival. The explosions became the first clue to the identity of the defiant individual. The second came when he managed to break free from the sludge, unleashing a resounding yell. You picked the wrong guy to mess with. I'm gonna send you back to the sewer you crawled out of, let me go. Explosions erupted from his hands, marking the third clue. Finally, their eyes locked eyes filled with panic and fear. 
a silent plea for help that connected with Izuku's own gaze. Izuku would never forget Katsuki Bakugu's red eyes. He ran into the next alley, unzipping his yellow backpack and pulling out his costume. Unfortunately, he left Blackout back at the warehouse, but that was okay. It wasn't meant for close combat anyway. Maybe he should invest in getting a handgun. Zero buckled his belt around his waist and flipped the hood of his jacket up to cover his green hair, pulled up the mask over his face, and ran back out, jumping over the civilians and heroes. No you idiot, stop, you're gonna get yourself killed. Death Arms yelled behind him. Oh, and what do you plan to do? Stand there and watch a child die. You're nothing but pathetic excuses for heroes. Zero's voice echoed with anger. He refocused on the criminal, who lunged forward, launching a relentless attack. With swift agility, Zero leaped and dodged, evading the assailant's slimy arms. His entire form is composed of sludge. Landing an effective blow against his body won't be easy as eyes narrowed in contemplation. But his eyes. In a calculated move, Zero retrieved a small pocket knife. Flipping it open, he held the blade delicately between his thumb and index finger before expertly hurling it through the air. The knife spun with precision, finding its mark in the criminal's left eye. A sharp scream of pain pierced the air as the criminal's mouth widened, revealing Katsuki's trapped body. Without hesitation, Zero seized the moment, gripping the forearm and pulling Katsuki free. Gasping for air, Katsuki sucked in the precious oxygen, now available. The criminal emitted a gurgling screech of rage, blood streaming from the injured eye, and launched another ferocious attack on Zero. You damn brat, I'll kill you. Zero pulled out his bow staff and extended it, bending his knees to attack, but someone else beat him to it. All Might himself swooped down and punched the criminal, creating a huge tornado of air from the force. Z grabbed the back of Katsuki's uniform. He pressed a button on the staff, and a sharp blade shot out of the bottom. Zero embedded it into the ground, just as the wind made the teenagers fly off their feet. Zero made sure to keep a secure grip on his childhood best friend as he held onto his staff with a white-knuckled grip. When the wind receded, they fell back to the ground with a grunt. Zero stood and pulled the staff out of the ground and retracted the blade before shrinking it and pocketing it just as it started to rain. In front of him, all Might stumbled back, barely noticeable, but still made the vigilante's eyes narrow, as the symbol of peace raised his fist in the air and everyone cheered. Zero rolled his eyes so hard they almost got stuck in his skull. A hand grasped his shoulder, just pulling him back before he reacted. Zero spun, grabbing Death Arm's bicep, and shoved him to the ground. Don't touch me. He hissed into his ear. The cheers died down, now focused on him. He met Katsuki's eyes briefly before he shot his grappling hook out and was gone before anyone could really look at him. I saw the news, Aizawa said three days after the sludge villain, as they sat on a roof, eating the bento boxes Aizawa had packed for them. Izuku sighed. I figured. A vein pulsed on his forehead. It just made me so mad when the so-called heroes just decided to wait until another came with a quirk more suitable to take him down while someone was dying. He shoved the last piece of rice into his mouth and opened his gun case. Izuku stuck his hand underneath the silicone cushions and pulled out a bunch of cleaning supplies. He disassembled the sniper and started cleaning it roughly. Aizawa didn't say anything, letting him cool off a bit. I thought about what you said, Izuku said, and when Aizawa looked at him, Izuku's face was solemn. Sometimes I think about how I just disregard the law and do things on my own. Hell, I'm not even registered into the foster system. But then I think about everything that I've done and say, this is what I'm meant to do. I had given up on the dream of becoming a hero a long time ago, and it was mostly because of the things all of the kids had said to me back then. Saying that with a quirk like mine, I could never become the hero that I've always wanted to be. He looked at the dark sky. If I'm being honest, I love the feeling of running from the law. He let out a laugh. You think someone with that kind of attitude could be a pro-hero? Aizawa just eyed him thoughtfully. 
I think that someone who is so determined to protect the people who simply get their purses stolen can be a hero. Not just fighting villains. There are a lot of people who only become heroes for fame and money. You are one of the few who do it for the ones who can't protect themselves. You're already a hero kid. No matter what the police or other citizens think. Izuku swung his feet gently. I couldn't even save my mom. He whispered. Aizawa knew how he felt. He understood that feeling of not being able to save someone in time. He pushed away the face of Aburo Shurikumo and focused on the child in front of him. It's true that there is still a lot for you to learn, but right now, I know that you can become a pro. He rested his hand on his shoulder. You can become a hero. Izuku bit his lip, shining wide eyes. He chuckled and stood when the sun crept into the sky. Aizawa stood as well as Izuku pulled up his mask and hood, becoming his other persona. His grappling hook wrapped around the building next to them and pulled on it to make sure it was secured. Aizawa thought he was going to jump away, but he looked at him over his shoulder again and the hero swore he saw a spark of light in those dark eyes. You know, you're not what I thought you'd be like. He said softly and Aizawa raised a brow. What? Mean and scary? The edges of his eyes crinkled when Izuku smiled. Yeah, Aizawa bent down to his level. Yeah, well, I actually thought you'd be kinda mean and scary too. He said softly and the 14-year-old let out a disbelieving laugh and jumped away. Aizawa smiled after him as his silhouette disappeared around the building. Izuku may be one of the most skilled snipers in the world, but under all of that bravado, he was still just a kid. He's going down Eastwood Street. Eraserhead said into the calms in his ear. Zero flipped onto another roof five miles away, looking through the maximized scope, and spotted the speeding black car. Zero smirked and loaded a rigged bullet that was meant to expand into spikes once the target was hit by the magazine. He had never shot at a moving car before, but that was okay. Because he never misses. Bang. The bullet went through the tire and the car started to spin uncontrollably down the street. Zero reloaded with a paralysis bullet and stared at the man, who fell out of the car with a hand over his mouth, from the scope of blackout. He snatched up a crying girl from the back seat with bright orange hair and scales running across her cheeks, using her as a human shield as he frantically looked around for Zero. He didn't stand for long, though as a racer head swooped in and took him down instantly. Zero hummed with satisfaction, folding the gun's legs and swinging the strap over his shoulder, walking towards the back of the roof, ready to go home. Aizawa sat on the only chair in Izuku's living space, while Izuku's glowing yellow hands hovered over the deep cuts in Aizawa's arms. The boy was wincing the whole time, not from any discomfort or pain, but at the heated glare that Aizawa had been staring at him with for the past half hour. They had stopped a robbery that night and Izuku had accidentally given Aizawa the wrong directions from his position in a tree, leading to him getting ambushed soon after. Izuku backed up when the cuts were fully healed without a scar, and he clasped his hands together sheepishly as Aizawa glowered at him. Not that I need protection, but I thought you said that you wouldn't put me in danger if you could help it. Izuku smiled. Trust me, I would never put you in danger. He paused. Again. When the adult didn't say anything, Izuku wanted to melt into the floor. Okay, I can't promise. But it's time to go out again. Are you in or out? Izuku cocked his gun. It wasn't every day that a racer head found himself tied to a chair facing his equally tied up teenage partner. At first, this wasn't what the man had in mind when they were going to infiltrate a supposed drug smuggler's base. Zero had only looked around the huge warehouse without a care in the world. They were all alone after they were captured, all their weapons taken. However, Eraserhead did notice that Zero had left Blackout back at his place. And now, the masked figure in front of Zero was holding up the barrel of his gun at him, making Eraserhead's heart get stuck in his throat. But when he didn't shoot him, Zero started talking. Breaking the law, huh? How original. I bet no one has ever thought of that before. You must be a trendsetter in the criminal underworld. Zero remade. Eraserhead rolled his eyes. 
Congratulations on your life choices. I've always thought a life of crime could use a bit more pizzazz. Have you considered a colorful costume or a catchy criminal name? Picture this. The Technicolor Terror or Rainbow Rogue. Just imagine the headlines. But hey, I'm just an aspiring vigilante. What do I know about branding? Maybe stripes on your prison uniform will be your signature style. The man's eyebrow twitched in annoyance. Are you trying to make me squeeze this trigger? Zero's eyes examined the drug smuggler up and down and raised a brow under his hood. It would speed up the process. Don't worry, I'm gonna do it, he said. They weren't sure if he was saying that to convince them or himself. Zero snorted. Okay. He wiggled in his seat like he was getting more comfortable and stared him in the eyes, making the man uncomfortable. I am. Whatever. I am. I'm going to shoot you. Zero hummed, stared at the gun pointed at his head, and waited, and waited, and waited. Zero licked his lips underneath the mask and leaned forward. How much longer is this going to take? He whispered like he was telling a secret. This is cutting closer to my decompressing time, and it takes a full eight hours of sleep to look this good. He taunted. The man's hands jerked, and he pulled the trigger. Eraserhead's eyes widened, but the gun just clicked. The two men stared at it, and he tried again, but it was empty. Zero sighed. You should really check to see if your guns are loaded first. Zero lifted his freed hands and opened his palm, letting a handful of bullets clatter to the ground and attacking the man, knocking him out cold. Zero grabbed a knife from the guy's body and cut through the ropes holding Eraserhead. He stood, rubbing his wrists. Zero grabbed his sleeve and pulled him into the storage room where their weapons resided. Zero looked at his watch and his eyes widened. He started shoving all of his knives into his costume. Come on, we should probably go. He shot the grappling hook onto the railing above them and jumped out the window. Eraserhead followed closely behind after grabbing the unconscious criminal and maneuvered across buildings. Boom. The older man jumped and turned back to the warehouse that was now on fire. The pro stared at it and then glared at the boy beside him, who had his hands behind his back and was twisting his toes into the ground. Relax, it was just a low-powered grenade, and no one was in the building, I think. He mumbled and Eraserhead scowled. Aizawa tapped his foot on the ground impatiently. Where the hell is he? Hizashi was biting his lip to hold in the laughter as he watched his husband lose his mind. To be fair, Izuku was an hour late. Apparently, punctuation wasn't in his vocabulary. After working with him for two years, Aizawa discovered that the boy admired present Mike. He had caught him listening to his radio show one time and Izuku was so enthralled that he didn't hear him come in. He had asked the boy once after a mission if he wanted to meet present Mike and he greedily said yes, but now he was late. The underground pro grumbled under his breath and pulled out his phone. Hisashi covered his mouth. He'd never seen someone get under his skin like that before. Not even one of his kids from the classroom. The sleep-deprived man slapped the phone against his ear, and the line clicked. Hey, um, I'm sorry I'm running a bit late. Zero's breathless voice said from the other line. I got stuck in some traffic. Traffic? You can zip line across the city, and you somehow get stuck in traffic? Where are you? Zero laughed nervously, stuttering over street signs. Ah, uh, five minutes, ten tops. Aizawa suddenly stared at the wall behind Hizashi with a deadpan expression. Are those sirens? Hizashi's mouth dropped, and the boy on the other line hesitated. No, Midoriya. He growled. No, no sirens. So hung up. Aizawa's eye twitched. Problem child, I swear. Fifteen minutes later, someone landed on the balcony, hands on his knees. Aizawa threw the sliding door open, arms crossed. Zero straightened, hand rubbing the back of his head. Ha ha sorry. He said sheepishly when Aizawa loomed over him. You didn't expel your class this year? Not even one person. You must really like them. Izuku said, 
biting off another piece of his rice ball. Aizawa rolled his eyes. What do you want me to say? That I saw potential in all of them and decided to keep them for myself. Izuku opened his rice-filled mouth. Oh my gosh. I never thought I'd live to see the day that the eraser head actually likes the kids in his class this year. Aizawa's lips tightened. There is this one boy though. He's strong, but he thinks too highly of himself. Izuku shoved the last piece into his mouth. Oh, and what's his quirk? His sweat acts as nitroglycerin, and he uses it to make explosions. He explained and Izuku stilled. Aizawa noticed the sudden silence and looked at him. The boy smiled. He made it into you, uh huh? I knew he could. Aizawa raised a brow. You know him? Izuku's smile went sad. Katsuki Bakugo? Yeah, we were childhood friends. He um, he pushed me away after my quirk manifested. He was pretty angry about it. The teacher's mind reeled at this information. He pushed you away because of your quirk? Izuku nodded. We were gonna be the best hero duo, with him being number one. Yuo was our dream school, but my quirk isn't made for combat, so he got rid of me. He looked at his hands. I know he's aggressive and a jerk, but I miss my best friend. Policemen and fire trucks sped by, alarms blaring. The two of them donned their second personas and followed. Aizawa rolled his eyes at the commotion in the back of the bus. Bakugo was riled up again thanks to them insulting him. He thought about what Izuku had told him about him, and he kept an eye on him the next day and noticed a green and black bracelet made out of string on his wrist. That had him curious because Izuku played with a matching orange and black bracelet on his wrist sometimes. Maybe Bakugo missed him too. Izuku said that since they couldn't find him, the police announced him dead, so he had a gravestone next to his mother. I'm going to encourage this dumbass to explode. He yelled and Aizawa had enough. Luckily, their destination was in sight. Hey, hey enough, we're here. Seriously. And he thought Izuku was his only problem child. He was too tired for this. This whole class was the definition of chaos. He got off the bus and ignored the students as they awed at the huge dome-like building. Welcome to the Asji. He simply said and walked up the steps to the building where 13 was waiting for them. When everyone was inside, Aizawa closed the metal doors and walked up to the rescue hero. Wasn't All Might supposed to be here today? Let me guess, he booked an interview. He said sarcastically. He was a good hero, but he hated the way that he just soaked up all of the attention and showed off for the people instead of doing his job. 13 held up three fingers saying that he was resting in the teacher's lounge. Ah, so he used up all of his energy stopping crime this morning, huh? Aizawa scowled. The big oaf is so careless, and that irked him in so many ways. His phone dinged, and he dug it out of his pocket, while 13 explained what they were doing today. It's kinda hard to do my job if someone else is taking all the glory. Izuku didn't sound very happy with the man either. Aizawa almost smiled. He had never met anyone else who wasn't the biggest fan of the guy. His hands hovered over the keyboard to respond and his screen suddenly went black. He raised a brow confused. Then the spotlights above them shattered. His dark eyes widened and he slowly turned to the bottom of the stairs. The fountain stuttered before it went out and then a black and purple mass exploded out. Aizawa paled and a hand stuck out from the warp gate pushing it back to reveal a face that was covered with a severed hand. Soon after that, hundreds of people started coming out of the warp gate. Aizawa spun around, holding out an arm when the students tried to follow. Stay back. This is real. Those are villains. He pulled up his goggles and grasped his scarf. Thirteen, protect the students. He jumped down the stairs. The alarms haven't gone off. Is someone's quirk interfering with the signal? He activated his erasure and took down three of them instantly. Others lunged at him, and he expertly dodged all of the kicks and punches before retaliating with his own. He was so used to having Zero in his ear and fighting with him that felt weird to fight on his own again, but it was nothing that he couldn't do on his own. In the corner of his eye, 
the warp gate villain suddenly disappeared in front of the students. Damn. I look away for one second, and the guy that seems like the most trouble gets away. He went to go back up, but more villains stood in his way. God, they never ended. So he kept fighting them, trusting Thirteen to take care of them. The one with the severed hands stepped forward and a racer head kicked the last villain away and ran towards him as well. Final boss. First it was 23 seconds. Then it was 24 seconds. The villain latched onto the scarf that came for him. And then 20. Then 17. Shigaraki reached for him, but a racer head dodged and elbowed him in the gut. Shigaraki grabbed his elbow and leaned in just as a racer head blinked. It was hard to see when you were jumping around, but I've found your tell. It's your hair. The racer head's bloodshot eyes widened and his black shirt began to decay. He grunted and tried to pull back, but Shigaraki held on. When it drops, it means you've stopped using your quirk. You're having to blink more often. Don't push yourself too hard now. You might just fall apart. Wouldn't that be a shame? His skin cracked until the muscle appeared. The racer head gasped in pain and punched him away. Shigaraki fell to the ground and the pro jumped back. He destroyed my elbow. He looked to the side and dodged another villain. Two more came up behind him, and he also managed to avoid them. Shigaraki stood up. That annoying quirk of yours isn't suited for drawn-out fights against big groups, is it? Don't you think you're a little out of your element here, Eraserhead? You're much better at working stealthily. You're known for surprise attacks, not fighting head-to-head. -head. But despite knowing that, you didn't hesitate to jump into the middle of this fight. To put your students at ease. Eraserhead dodged and kicked another villain away from him when he lunged. He activated his quirk again, grabbed his scarf, and faced Shigaraki again, who spread his arms. And look at you, you're still standing. You really are so cool. He looked over his shoulder. Oh by the way hero, Eraserhead stiffened when a shadow fell over his body and looked over his shoulder, only to gasp at the monster towering over him. I am not the final boss. The hero thumbed the object in his pocket. Izuku grabbed Aizawa's hand. Here, I made this for you. He held out a black alarm and dropped it into his outstretched hand. For when you need me, if you're ever in trouble, just press this button and it'll send a distress signal to my watch with your location. Aizawa's eyebrows raised, but he closed his hand around it. I just hope you know that I'll never activate it. I'm capable of fighting my own battles. Izuku just shrugged. Fine, don't use it. It might bring me a little comfort if you don't, but humor me and take it. Please. He flashed his puppy eyes and Aizawa sighed, stuffing the alarm in his pocket, mumbling something that sounded like, problem child, and turned to leave, looking at him over his shoulder. I'm never gonna press this button kid. Eraserhead pressed the button. Izuku sneezed when gunpowder erupted from the barrel of blackout and into his face. He was so bored. Thanks to All Might, Izuku didn't get to stop any crimes. It didn't matter if they were small things like stopping another purse snatcher or a robbery. He just wanted to do something. He sighed and placed the disassembled parts into the black case. Since Aizawa was teaching all day, Izuku couldn't go over to his house and bother him. And another thing, with All Might in town, the crime rate in this city had lowered drastically. He groaned, flopping back onto the mess of pillows and blankets. There's nothing to dee. He flinched when his wrist vibrated suddenly, and shot up so fast he almost got whiplash. He looked down and saw a location on the screen. Eraserhead's location. He pressed the button. Izuku went pale, but changed into his costume in record time and flew out of the window. It took him longer than he wanted to get to the Yasuji, but he eventually landed on top of the glass dome. He scanned the situation and snarled at the beast restraining Aizawa. Zero assembled and loaded his sniper with the strongest bullet he had lined up to the creature. Bang. The bullet ripped through Namu's chest. The thing screamed, grip loosening from around a racer head, and Zero took his chance of shooting through the glass and scooping Aizawa up from the ground, just before the bullet detonated inside the beast, leaving a gaping hole. 
Zero spotted Shigaraki crouched over two kids and lunged for him next. The younger boy's rapid movement left a gust of wind in its wake, dislodging Shigaraki's severed hand mask. With agile precision, Zero grabbed the two kids from the water, a fluid display of heroism. He ascended swiftly, returning to the upper level where others were gathered on top of the stairs. The girls, tears streaming down their faces, cradled Thirteen, whose mangled back bore witness to the brutal assault. Aizawa was gently laid down as the gravity of the situation hung heavily in the air. Frustration flared within Zero as he directed a hiss at the unconscious man. You idiot, he whispered harshly, retracting the grappling hook into the gun. A fistful of high-powered paralysis bullets clenched in his hand, Zero glared at the scene. Witnessing Namu regenerate itself after the previous bullet impact, he decided on the next best course of action to paralyze the formidable foe and hope for the best. Why didn't you press it sooner? I could have helped. Zero loaded the paralysis bullets into his weapon and marched towards the top of the stairs, his gaze fixed on the teenagers. What happened? He demanded from the students behind him, adjusting his sniper on the ground. Silence hung in the air, prompting Zero's frustration to morph into a snarl. Tell me, what happened? The girl in green stepped forward, her voice trembling as she began recounting the nightmarish events that unfolded in the Usji, and Zero listened intently, his masked expression revealing nothing of the turmoil within. Then the boy in yellow and white stepped up. Our classmate, Tenya Ida, managed to escape and go alert the pros at the school. The girl in green stepped forward. They said that they were here to kill All Might. Zero nodded once. That must be what that thing down there is for. With a swift, almost predatory movement, Zero lowered himself to the ground, lying on his stomach as he lined up the sniper with a monstrous Namu, who was starting to rise. Shigaraki and Kirijiri scanned the Asji attempting to locate the elusive vigilante. Zero cocked the sniper, his focused gaze locked on Namu, and pulled the trigger. The rubber bullet whizzed through the air, finding its mark on Namu's neck. Immediately activated, the creature collapsed to its knees once again. Shigaraki and Kirijiri spun their attention to their creation, still unaware of the vigilant figure lurking in the shadows. Zero, undeterred and fueled by the thrill of battle, swiftly loaded another bullet into his sniper, ready for the next move in this high-stakes confrontation. The intensity of the moment hung thick in the air as the mysterious vigilante prepared to face the looming threats in defense of his allies. Bang. 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 Namu went down again, twitching feebly on the ground. If Zero was right about the regeneration time, then he should have at least one to two minutes before the effects wore off. A way shorter time than what even one of those bullets can really last. Zero directed it to Kirijiri next, knowing that he was going to be a problem while he took on Shigaraki. Bang. The bullet went through Kirijiri's armored neck and lightning sparked around him. There. Problem solved. Zero dusted his gloved hands off and stood, throwing blackout across his back. Shigaraki finally spotted him at the top and Zero drew his fifteen knife. How long ago did your classmate escape? About ten minutes ago. The muscular boy in yellow told him. Zero's low hum resonated through the tense air as he and Shigaraki locked eyes in an unspoken challenge. And where are the rest of you? Zero inquired, his tone steady and analytical. We don't know. That purple mist guy scattered us everywhere. Nodding with understanding, Zero contemplated the scattered heroes on the ground. Judging from the ones on the ground, those were their minions, or were there more? If there are, then he probably sent all of them to fight your classmates in the other areas, he deduced, his sharp eyes narrowing in thought. He shifted his attention to Asui, addressing her directly. Your name is Asui, right? And your quirk is Frog? Zero's question hung in the air, and Asui responded with a jump of surprise, emitting a distinct ribbit. I found you guys in the water. They must not know what your quirks are, or else they would have sent you to the fire zone over there, he observed, a strategic glint in his eyes. Zero clicked his tongue in mild frustration, grappling his hook up to the support beams. 
With swift and calculated movements, he swung toward Shigaraki who had his hand outstretched, fingers tense. Zero twisted away from the outstretched hand, and Zo seamlessly skidded to a stop behind him. The precision of Zero's maneuvers showcased his combat prowess, leaving a momentary lull in the confrontation as both adversaries assessed each other's next move. The urgency of the situation intensified, and the dance between vigilante and villain unfolded with a cadence of calculated strategy and unpredictable finesse. But Zero didn't see his foot coming until the air was kicked out of his lungs. He wheezed and slid to a halt a few feet away, holding on to his stomach. Five-fingered activation, huh? I can work with that. Who are you? Another NPC? He said. Zero's eyebrows shot up and straightened, unsheathing his knife and flipping it into the air, catching it by the handle when it came back down. A smirk played on Zero's masked face as he responded to Shigaraki's taunt. NPCs are just scripted lines and predictable actions. I'm more like a hidden boss with a few tricks up my sleeve, he quipped, his tone laced with a hint of amusement. Shigaraki's eyes gleamed with curiosity. Hidden boss, huh? Well, this just got interesting. Let's see if you can survive the next level, he replied, a wicked grin forming on his face. The challenge hung in the air, and a newfound interest sparked in Shigaraki's eyes as he prepared for the unpredictable encounter with the enigmatic vigilante. Zero's masked face betrayed no emotion as he countered Shigaraki's offer with a smirk. Join your party? I prefer gatherings where people aren't trying to destroy everything. Call me old-fashioned, but I'm not into chaos for chaos's sake. Now, if you're looking for someone who knows how to make a grand entrance and steal the spotlight, you might want to reconsider your recruitment strategy. Shigaraki's twisted grin faltered for a moment, replaced by a thoughtful glint in his eyes. The unexpected response from Zero intrigued him. Huh, a hero with a sense of humor. Now that's rare. Zero twitched with irritation at Shigaraki calling him a hero. Maybe you're not as boring as the rest of them. Shigaraki's interest was piqued, a sinister curiosity lurking beneath his words. Let's see what you've got, vigilante. Show me just how entertaining you can be. He crossed his arms. Namu. The monster rose to his feet and Zero cursed under his breath. The paralysis had worn off. He calmed his nerves and was pulled to the ceiling by the grappling hook to dodge the monster. It jumped from the ground and Zero unhooked the rope from his belt. Dropping towards Namu grabbed the thick arm and plunged his black blade through its neck. Namu screeched, and they fell back to the ground. They fell to the ground and Zero did a straight body backflip, extending the bow staff and swinging at Shigaraki, who sidestepped and tried to touch him again. But Zero grabbed his wrist and flipped him over his shoulder. The man wheezed when the air was knocked out of his lungs and rolled to the side, making Zero's staff hit the stone. He shivered when the reverberations snaked through his body uncomfortably. Kirajiri struggled to stand, his form twitching violently at irregular intervals. Witnessing Shigaraki's own battle, he attempted to lend a hand, but a piercing scream cut through the air and an explosive projectile collided with his neck armor, sending him sprawling to the ground once again. Katsuki stood over him, a victorious smirk on his face. Found your body that time, you smoky bastard, Katsuki taunted, relishing in his triumph. Meanwhile, Kirishima, displaying his signature resilience, somersaulted over Kirijiri to engage with Shigaraki. However, Shigaraki evaded Kirishima's attack, attempting to grab him, only to be intercepted by Zero. Move, Zero commanded, forcefully pushing Kirishima out of harm's way. As Shigaraki attempted to grab Zero, the vigilante skillfully maneuvered, sitting on his shoulders. With a swift twist, Zu spun Shigaraki's body, utilizing the momentum to land on top of the villain's chest. As Shigaraki stared up with murderous intent, Zero's arm reeled back delivering a powerful punch that dislodged the hand covering Shigaraki's face. Shigaraki's red eyes bore into zero, and the vigilante couldn't help but grimace at the intensity of the gaze. In an attempt to defuse the tension, Zero remarked, Oh, you are in dire need of chapstick, my friend. Maybe a little moisturizer? 
Shigaraki growled in response, successfully bucking Zero off, though the vigilante allowed it, swiftly flipping back over to shield the three boys behind him. The trio of heroes in training observed the unfamiliar boy with a mix of awe and confusion. Meanwhile, Shigaraki, recovering from the assault on his neck, picked up his severed hand and seamlessly reattached it to his face. A visible wave of relief washed over him as the hand found its place. With a momentary pause, Shigaraki eyed the enigmatic figure before him, backing up while rubbing his sore neck. Zero, ever vigilant, maintained a protective stance over the kids, ready to face whatever challenges the chaotic battlefield threw their way. Ha! Huh. You got careless, you dumb villain. It wasn't hard to figure you out. Only certain parts of you turn into that smoking warp gate. You used that mist to hide your actual body, as a kind of distraction, thinking that made you safe. But if you didn't have a body, you wouldn't be wearing this neck armor, right? You're not immune to physical attacks if they're well-aimed. Kirajiri groaned and tried to move, but Katsuki let loose a couple of small explosions. Don't move. He leaned down and grinned psychotically. You try anything funny, and I'll blow your ass up so bad, they'll be piecing you back together for weeks. Zero rolled his eyes. Of course, he had never changed. In fact, he seemed even worse. Oh, that doesn't sound very heroic. Kirishima said. Shigaraki clasped his hands. They escaped uninjured and captured my two strongest men. Kids these days really are amazing. They make the League of Villains look like amateurs. Can't have that. Zero scrunched his nose. They named themselves the League of Villains? How original. Shigaraki looked at the monster, who reached up and tore the blade out of his neck. Namu. Zero's eyes widened in shock. Holy. He seriously underestimated its regeneration time. Zero pulled Black out off of his back and loaded another explosion bullet into it. Shigaraki looked at Katsuki. First, we need to free our method of escape. Oh gasped. No. Get him Namu. The monster lunged. The doors blasted open. And Zero fired. The bullet hit home through Namu's head. But Zero was too close when the explosion went off. He flew back into Katsuki, who grunted from the impact. Zero gasped for breath and scrunched his nose at the stench of sizzling skin. Shit. Zero hovered his hand over his arm, and it glowed a bright orange. He groaned and stood, the skin on his arm growing back. He looked back at Namu. There was no way in hell he could regenerate after that. His head exploded. Kirijiri warped next to Shigaraki, who was seething with absolute rage and shock. He cheated. The villain reached up, scratching his neck until his dry skin tore. Farther from them. The minions that Aizawa had taken down were starting to regain consciousness. Then he walked in. Everyone was quiet as All Might appeared at the top of the stairs. The minions didn't even have a chance to speak before the number one hero knocked them back down again and stood in front of the four kids. He was still very confused about who the other boy was, but knew for a fact that he wasn't a villain, given that he saw him kill the Namu to protect Katsuki. It looks like you've been bested villains. Surrender, All Might said. Shigaraki ignored him and stared at the vigilante, who walked up beside All Might, arm healed and loading blackout with a real bullet this time. Who are you? Shigaraki hissed. Zero glared at him. Not only did he hurt Aizawa, but he also tried to kill Katsuki. Bang. Shigaraki jolted as bullets ripped through his shoulders and hands. Kurajiri wrapped himself around Shigaraki to protect him from the pros at the entrance of the Asuji. Let's get out of here, Kurajiri told Shigaraki, but he grunted when a force ripped him away from him. Thirteen was conscious again and using all five finger canisters to suck in Kurajiri. Shigaraki kept his eyes on Zero, though as he sunk deeper into the purple mass. I'll find you, Ro. They disappeared. Izuku stared at the closed gate of Yua High School from across the street. He wasn't in his costume, but if they even let him in, he'd have no choice but to give his identity away if he wanted to heal Aizawa. There's no way out of it. They'll ask him how he knows him, maybe even ask how his quirk is so advanced. 
He believed that Recovery Girl was handling his healing well, but there were still going to be drawbacks. He would be bedridden for at least a week considering his injuries and Recovery Girl's quirk limitations. With his quirk, Aizawa would be fully healed in at least six hours. He sucked in a breath of courage and walked up to the gates, gulping at the size of it. While Zero was strong and brave, and would no doubt scale this wall with ease, Izuku was a weak nerdy boy who was easily targeted by bullies. Um, hello, he said meekly to the small black dot stuck at the top. My name is Izuku Midoriya. I'm here to see Mr. Aizawa. Nothing. Did they even know he was there? Could they even hear him? I know that you have recovery girl, but my quirk can heal him faster than hers can. He can be back on his feet by the end of the day. Silence. Izuku huffed in impatience, looking around. He was alone. This was a long shot, but it was probably the only way to get into the school, he said seriously, without hesitation. I am Zero, Japan's most wanted vigilante. I have come here with good intentions to pay back a debt that is long overdue. That finally got something out of them. The ground shook and the gate opened. Izuku tensed at the three pros on the other side. Years of analysis and observations told him that the ones on the side were Snipe and Midnight and the one in the middle. Principal Nezu. One of the most intelligent beings in this world. No one knew what he really was. Whether he was a mouse, a bear, a stout, anything. Not even him. The animal walked forward with a smile that made him shiver. Well, it's an honor to meet the famous Zero that I've heard so much about. I must admit that I am surprised that a child had outsmarted the police and heroes and made his own gear. Your inventions are on par with power loaders. Izuku blushed at the praise. You're really just going to take my word for it? Nezu hummed. Why would you have any reason to lie? You say that you've only come to heal one of my teachers with a healing quirk that is better than our dear recovery girl? His smile turned a little wicked. Are you lying? The boy shook his head. No, no, I'm not. Nezu waved a white paw. Then come inside. Tell me how you know Eraserhead. Izuku couldn't help but hesitate. This seemed a little too easy. They were just gonna let him in? Without some kind of proof? Surely they would be suspicious about a kid admitting that he was zero instead of an adult. Especially after what just happened at the Asji. Izuku moved his foot back slightly. This was a bad idea. If they are really taking me seriously, then they know who I am now. My name, my face. Noticing this, Nezu's smile softened. Don't worry, we won't turn you into the police. I'm quite interested to see how you'll heal Eraserhead. I understand why you're wary. But you could say that we also owe you for saving our students during the attack. He clenched his fists nervously, but walked into the gates of Yua. Izuku looked around the school he'd once dreamed of going to. Aizawa had told him that they had a rehabilitation program and that he could become a pro hero instead of being a vigilante. Nezu led him to the recovery girl's office. He still felt uncomfortable about how this was turning out, and the judging stares from the two pros behind him wasn't helping his stress. And with stress came unfocus. He couldn't treat his partner properly with that kind of mindset. In fact, it could reverse everything that Recovery Girl had done, possibly even worse. When the door slid open, Recovery Girl and present Mike's attention drew from the man on the bed. The blonde's eyes widened at Izuku, while the old ladies narrowed in confusion. Who's this? she snapped. Izuku raised a brow. Wow, someone hasn't had their coffee. He mustered the strength to walk forward. I'm Izuku Midoriya and I'm here to heal Mr. Aizawa. He said and present Mike made a noise of what Izuku thought of as relief. Recovery girl spun to him. Excuse me. I have an advanced healing quirk called Vitakinesis. I can heal almost any injury. Eraserhead has taken me in and protected me for two years. I have done nothing but assist him during his patrols, even though I know he doesn't need any help and give him gray hairs. Present Mike had to cough at that. But now, it's time that I return the favor. 
He didn't wait for an invitation before walking over to Aizawa. He grimaced at the sight of the man covered head to toe in bandages. Arms wrapped thickly with more rolls of them. He looked like a mummy from a sarcophagus. Izuku took a deep breath and turned to everyone in the room. Everyone but present Mike and Nezu was tense, even though he was surrounded by pros. Listen, with these types of injuries I need complete and utter silence. I cannot lose focus or else I could make it even worse. Please just give me space to work. He said simply and moved his hands over the bandages around Aizawa's face. Eyes first. That way he isn't too tired to do them after he heals the rest of his body. Nezu ushers them all out of the room, much to their hushed protests. Present Mike stayed though so even if Izuku tried something, he would take care of him first. His hands started to glow a dark orange, close to red as he laid them softly over his eyes. Izuku smiled. It's good to see you again, Present Mike. The man's head snapped up. I thought you said no one could talk. Or was that just a way to get everyone out of the room? His blonde brows raised under his orange shades. Izuku hummed. No, even though his eyes are damaged, they're not as serious as the rest of his body, so I wasn't lying. He explained and the hero relaxed, giving him a smile of his own. It's good to see you too, little listener. They made small talk until Izuku's hands turned green, letting them know that his face was done. So, Izuku moved on to his body and his hands went red. Present Mike swallowed. The boy had explained that when he's healing someone, his hands glow a color to determine how serious the injury is. Green. Healed. Yellow. Minor. Orange. Damage. Red. Critical. Black. Life-threatening. He wasn't thrilled that they were red, but at least it wasn't black. Izuku stared behind him, eyes almost glowing and glazed over and darting everywhere. Apparently, part of his quirk was that he could see a human's anatomy and determine what type of care was needed. Twenty minutes later, beads of sweat glistened on Izuku's face and neck. His breathing was getting more labored too. Present Mike wanted to tell him to take a break, but he looked so focused that he didn't dare say anything. Ten more minutes went by and his hands just turned yellow when Aizawa coughed on the bed. Izuku grunted and his hands retracted, glow fading. He almost collapsed into the chair behind him, but he left enough energy for himself to stand. Aizawa groaned and sat up without issue. Izuku reached up and pulled the bandages off of his face. Present Mike squawked, but his eyes widened when his face was revealed only showing a small scar underneath his right eye instead of the gruesome injuries from before. The man scrunched his eyes at the sudden bright light, but slowly adjusted, finding his husband first before the kid next to him. Izuku smiled tiredly at him, unwrapping the other bandages on his body, as the door reopened again and recovery girl gasped at the boy, rushing over to stop him from removing them, but was amazed when no injuries were present. You may not have serious injuries anymore, but I couldn't heal you completely. Your muscles will still be tense and your body will ache for at least six hours, so take it easy for the rest of the day. Izuku explained and finally sat down in a chair, breathing like he had just run a marathon. Aizawa only sighed, but then noticed the others in the room. He stared at them and then back at Izuku, who waved his hand dismissively. They know. I told them. It was the only way I could get in here peacefully. His face sombered. It's the least I could do for what you've done for me. His head nodded forward, and Aizawa caught his head before it could hit the railing of the gurney. Oh kid. He shook his head, but smiled, laying his head on the bed. Thank you. It was late in the afternoon when Izuku woke up again. He blinked drowsily at the white ceiling before shooting upright on the bed he lay on. Events from hours before plagued Izuku's mind as he scanned the empty room. Empty except for the black-haired man still on the hospital bed and shuffling through papers on a rolled table. You awake yet? Aizawa said, not even looking in his direction. Hizashi and Nezu told me what you did today. The message was clear. He was talking about how he just revealed who he was underneath the mask. Izuku cleared his throat. Well. What was I supposed to do? 
It was the only way to let me in. Aizawa sighed, laying the papers back down on the table. Why did you come here? Recovery girl would have gotten me healed without you. You didn't have to tell them your identity. He said softly. Izuku looked at his lap. I couldn't just sit in my bed waiting for you to come back and join me on patrols when I knew damn well that my abilities were better suited to heal you. Besides, I know you. He waved his finger at him with narrowed eyes. You would have gone back to teach your class no matter what kind of state you were in. Izuku's lip trembled, voice started to crack. And after I saw you in the Asji, he sniffled, wiping his eyes. Honestly, I couldn't stop thinking if you were even still alive. He sobbed and Aizawa's eyes softened, pushing the table away and opening his arms. Come here, kid. Izuku threw the blankets off his body and jumped straight into Aizawa's chest. The adult ignored the small sharp pain in his body when Izuku jumped into him and pulled him closer. He knew that Izuku had no one left and that he considered him a huge part of his life and Aizawa realized, as he raked his hand through his unruly green hair, just how scared Izuku truly was to lose him. And although he would never admit it, Aizawa couldn't bear the thought of losing him either. Izuku had become like a pseudo-son to him over the last two years. Izuku held up a new bullet, twisting it between his fingers. He had paralysis, explosions, net, real bullets, rigged, even paintballs, and now, healing bullets made from his own blood. Instead of the soft ball-like design, this was a square with a small needle to be able to inject through someone's sternum and heal them during battle since he couldn't. After seeing Aizawa, he wanted to make a more practical solution when he didn't have the time to do it himself. They don't pack as much of a punch, but it would be better than nothing. It's been a week since the villain attack and the sports festival was coming up. He eyed the ticket crammed into the edge of the small mirror on the wall. Aizawa had given it to him so that he could enjoy it in person and had asked him to write notes for Class 1A, saying that it would help with their training if he figured out any weaknesses or strengths. He had hesitated, of course. He knew that a huge majority of the crowd would be heroes, and he was still not a big fan of them. Present Mike's radio show always filled the silence of his lonely space. And Aizawa, well he was just so cool that he just couldn't find it in himself to hate him, especially with the relationship they had developed. But he did say that he was allowed to sit with them in the sound booth, so that made his decision a little easier. Izuku sighed, placing the bullet with the rest in an empty pouch on his utility belt and hanging it with the rest of his costume. Police and heroes have been on edge since the attack, so they've been patrolling the streets a lot and taking care of the petty crimes he would do. Again, giving him absolutely nothing to do. He was running low on some supplies. Guess he was going shopping. Besides, it was almost that day. A cold hand on his forehead woke him up. His eyes cracked open and looked at Aizawa crouching down next to him. Wah, why are you here? Izuku yawned, sitting up and rubbing his eyes. You didn't show up at our meeting spot. I came to check on you. He removed his hand from Izuku's forehead, now reassured that he wasn't sick. The boy went stiff, making Aizawa raise a brow. Izuku's bangs shadowed his face. Sorry. I usually stay in bed for a couple days during the 27th. It's my mom's anniversary. He mumbled quietly. Aizawa inhaled slowly. Of course. Izuku laid back down, curling underneath the blankets. Aizawa sighed and leaned against the wall next to his head. They sat in comfortable silence for a few minutes. You don't want to visit her? The teacher said quietly and Izuku sniffed. No, I feel like I don't deserve to. Not after everything. I was only eleven years old and I had a lot to say apparently. He scoffed. Kid, your mother loved you. I bet she forgave you. That's why she was looking for you that night. She was worried. Now you only need to forgive yourself. You are safe, you are healthy, and somehow have enough money to buy food and clothes and you're not alone. But you aren't happy. You've been carrying this guilt on your shoulders for four years. It's time to let go and forgive yourself. Izuku started to shake underneath the soft blanket, making Aizawa rest his hand gently on his shoulder. 
You will see her again someday, I promise. He continued softly. Have you ever lost someone? It was a very insensitive question, but Izuku wasn't in the right headspace to think about it. Aizawa closed his eyes. I have. I know exactly how you feel. My friend and I were only at our internships when we helped with a villain attack. He saved so many, and was the only casualty Izuku had lowered the blanket, now staring at him with red eyes. Aizawa smiled. You're a lot like him, you know. He said, not sure if he was saying it to Izuku or himself. The boy found the energy to sit up next to him. Could you tell me about him? That was how they spent the rest of the night. Aizawa tells him stories about Shouta Aizawa, Hizashi Yamada, and Aburo Shurikumo. Izuku slowly dragged his feet into the graveyard, carrying a handful of peonies. Aizawa was right though. He needed to let go of the past and focus on the future. He always did feel like something was holding him back. Maybe it was this. I Deku. Izuku stopped at the familiar voice. He looked over his shoulder slowly, but no one was there. He was probably just hearing things. But no, Katsuki Bakigu was here, and not just anywhere, a little way down the path in the place where his mom was supposed to be. Izuku crept up behind him and climbed up a tree, close enough that he could still hear him. Sorry, I haven't visited for a while. Katsuki grumbled as he plopped down in front of Izuku's grave. Life's been a mess, got into Yua, and then bam, villain attack like three days in. Can you believe it? All Might's playing teacher there now. And guess who I met. Thirteen, present Mike, and Eraserhead. Yeah, the guy we never even heard of. But you'd probably know him, being the hero nerd you were. Tearing up some grass absent-mindedly, Katsuki continued. If you're up there rolling your eyes, I get it. Therapy's a thing now, apparently. Yeah, even I'm surprised. But it's helping, I guess. Izuku blinked. Realizing Kekin goes to therapy. So, turns out I've been missing you more than I thought, Katsuki admitted, fiddling with a bracelet that Izuku recognized. They weaved them together when they were still close. Izuku couldn't believe he still had it. During the villain mess, this vigilante named Zero helped out. Crazy skills and a healing quirk, just like you blabbered about. Got me thinking, you know? What if it was you? Were you alive? But that was impossible, you were on the news for like two seconds before they moved on to some stupid shit. Katsuki sighed. There's this annoying dude who's claiming to be my friend. Follows me everywhere. A real pain. But he's not you. A smirk played on Izuku's lips at the notion of Katsuki having an annoying friend. He'll never replace you, Deku. Katsuki mumbled, almost to himself. You got me like no one else did. No words can undo what I did to you, but after your funeral, I decided to ditch the whole surpass All Might crap. I'm going for something bigger now I'm gonna be the number one hero, but not for the usual reasons. It's for you, nerd. With that, he got up and slung his school bag over his shoulder. For you, I'll be the best damn number one hero the world's ever seen. Just like you would have been. Katsuki declared walking away with a mix of determination and regret. It had taken a few minutes, but Izuku managed to sneak through the halls of the stadium and finally find the sound booth where Aizawa and Hizashi were supposed to be residing for the sports festival. He didn't bother knocking when he threw the door open and walked in, so both of them started when the door slammed against the wall dramatically. Or one of them did. Hizashi spun around in his chair, so fast it almost toppled to the floor and Aizawa just sighed. Izuku grinned when Hizashi stuttered over words to regain his composure and dragged another chair up to the booth, opening a fresh clean notebook to analyze the hero course's quirks to figure out any weaknesses or strengths they could work on. That was part of the reason why Aizawa wanted him to come. The other and biggest part was so that he would escape from his hermit lair, as Aizawa not so kindly said to him. Having to take Hizashi to the hospital for a heart attack was not on my to-do list problem child. Aizawa grumbled at him, making Izuku shrug. If you don't terrify people a little bit then what's the point? He retorted, snatching a roster of the students participating from a box beside him 
and scanning over their quirks. Hizashi cleared his throat and briefly glared at the teenage boy before the doors at the bottom of the stadium slowly opened, making the voice hero turn the speakers on to yell over the cheers and screams of the audience. Hey, make some noise, rabid sports fans. Present Mike screamed through the microphone. This year we are bringing you some of the hottest performances in sports festival history guaranteed. I've only got one question before we start this show. Are you ready? Let me hear you scream as our students make their way to the main stage. This first group are no strangers to the spotlight. You know them for withstanding a villain attack. The dazzling students that line up their classmates with solid gold skills. The hero course students of Class 1A, Class 1A steps out of the many tunnels, heads held high and shoulders back. Izuku's eyes landed on the specific team, leading in the front, and played with the orange and black bracelet on his wrist. They haven't got a whole lot of screen time, but this group is still chock full of talent. Welcome hero course Class 1B. Next up, general studies classes C, D, and E. Support classes F, G, and H, and finally, business classes I, G, and K. The crowd cheered as all the students walked onto the field. When they all gathered in front of a small stage, the pro hero Midnight snapped her whip. Now for the introductory speech. Everyone in the crowd and the students whispered and blushed at Midnight's vulgar attire. Silence everyone, she snapped her whip again. Now for the student pledge. We have Katsuki Bakugu, she announced. Izuku blinked in shock. Kaken is the first year rep? He asked Aizawa, and the man nodded. He was first in the entrance exams, remember? Izuku did remember that. He turned back and watched Katsuki casually walk up the stairs of the stage with his hands in his pockets. Izuku winced, biting his lip. Aizawa noticed this and asked him what was wrong. It's just that Kaken might not give the kind of speech everyone is thinking of. He might say something like, I just want to say, I'm gonna win. Katsuki said boredly but seriously. Izuku slapped his forehead when the students went into an uproar. That. But he said it with such a blank expression that the vigilante knew that he was actually serious. If he wasn't, he would have just laughed at everyone. He smiled. No. Katsuki Bakugo was going to win this year's sports festival. That was a promise. Izuku yawned, stretching his entire body after being hunched over his notebook for so long. It was lunch break so everyone in the stadium left for the cafeteria, including Aizawa and Hizashi, while Izuku stayed behind to finish his notebooks so that no one would see him. Especially Katsuki. Todoroki had won the first round of the festival which was racing but Katsuki had won the cavalry battle. And after lunch, the real fights would begin. The door opened, and Aizawa walked back in with a tray full of extra food. Izuku smiled at the man gratefully when he set it in front of him. Thanks, he said, ripping his chopsticks apart and digging into the rice bowl. How are the notes coming? Aizawa asked, picking up his notebook. Izuku sighed and leaned back in his chair. Pretty good. I think I've got plenty of information on Class 1B for the time being. And with the information you gave me about Class 1A, I'm ready to start their notebooks. I just need to go to the store and get them. He closed his eyes and sighed again at how much 40 notebooks are gonna cost. The door to the sound booth opened and Hizashi walked in with a toothy grin, carrying two heavy-looking bags and dropped them at Izuku's feet. The teenager raised a brow and peeked inside them, only for his eyes to widen at all of the stacked notebooks and boxes of regular and colored pencils sitting inside. Shouta, and I thought that since we were asking you to analyze the students' quirks and point out their strengths, weaknesses and suggestions that we can repay you with getting all of the supplies you need, so you don't need to go use the money you have to buy them. Izuku swallowed to keep from tearing up at the kindness and smiled at the heroes. Thank you. This means a lot to me. He grabbed the top notebook and a pencil, immediately scribbling inside the empty pages. Shouta and Hizashi smiled. Twenty minutes later, the audience and students started to walk back into the stadium and present Mike went to work on hyping them up, 
as the final games of the sports festival began. Izuku spent the rest of the week working on his notebooks, filling up every page with his opinion on Class 1A and 1B. He was just getting to Ijiro Kirishima when his watch chimed. It was almost time for his patrol. He stood and popped his back, wincing when the Katayan made him feel like an old man. Izuku shoved his costume in his backpack and blackout before walking out the door of his warehouse. He had this funny feeling about Hasu, so he decided to catch a train there instead of his usual route. Izuku was adamant to keep up with the news about the heroes that have been killed. At first, he thought that the League of Villains was behind it, but soon found out that it was by someone who called himself the hero killer, Stain, and he's been spotted in Hasu. He was still a little nervous though. What if he did find the hero killer? Not only did the man have more experience, but he's been taking down heroes left and right. What could a 16-year-old kid do against someone like that? Plus, no one knew what his quirk was. Another disadvantage that Izuku had to face. If he found him though, he was definitely going to keep his distance. Izuku suddenly stiffened, and he shivered. He reached into his backpack and pulled out his 15 black knife. Something was coming. Hey, did you see that? Someone in the back said, making the Izuku turn. That building over there exploded. Izuku's green eyes narrowed. Passengers, please hold on to your seats. Izuku yelled when he was thrown onto the floor from something crashing into the train. The screaming started and the hero that crashed through was grabbed by a sickly green hand and pushed to the floor. Another hand grabbed onto the wall and peeled it back revealing a familiar monster with its brain exposed, four eyes and sharp teeth. He ducked back to the floor and pulled on his costume as fast as he could in the tight space. By the time most of the civilians had cleared out, he jumped to his feet, making sure that Blackout's case was strapped to his back so he wouldn't lose it and didn't hesitate to attack it and ram it out of the train and off the hero. The vigilante shot his grappling hook out and it wrapped around the railroad track. He swung from where he hung and was expecting to see the Namu hit the ground, but wings suddenly sprouted from his back and he flew off. Zero rolled his eyes. Of course the Namu has wings. He swung his legs to get more momentum and landed on a nearby roof. Zero took off into a sprint and noticed the orange hue and smoke from the fires all around the city. He kneeled at the edge of a roof and assembled his sniper. A scream echoed from the street and Zero steadied his gun on the ledge, looking through his scope at a different Namu than before that was stumbling towards a couple. He loaded a real bullet and fired. Its screech cut off and it crumpled to the ground, blood squirting out from its brain. Zero cocked his gun and sneered when he spotted Endeavor down the road. As much as he wanted to shoot the guy, he turned and ran across the rooftops again. Tenya. Zero slid to a stop and jumped to the deserted street. Where are you, Tenya? His head whipped around, and he gasped when a bus crashed into a car and exploded. He covered the upper half of his face from the aftershocks. Zero lowered his arms, and his eyes widened at the heroes surrounding two more Namu. Oh no! Manuel, the normal hero ran to the water that shot straight into the air when another hero pulled it out of the ground. Manuel kept looking around though. Why did you run off by yourself? Where are you, Tenya? He directed the water towards the fires. Zero blinked. Tenya. As in Tenya Ida from Class 1A? What was he doing here? He shook his head and ran into an alley before the heroes saw him. There's no time to think about that now. I gotta find him. He was Aizawa's student. And if he was in trouble, then he had to help. Goodbye, child. May your death bring a better world. Stain said to an unmoving Ida. The sound of a gun was cocked, and his head snapped up just to see someone at the end of the alley raise their sniper. Bang. A net expanded from the bullet and wrapped around the villain. Stain grunted in shock and was thrown off his feet from the force of the impact, away from Ida. Zero ran forward and grabbed the boy's arm. Ida's eyes widened. It's you. You were at the usch. Can you stand? He asked, and Ida shook his head. I can't even move. 
Zero huffed in frustration, and just noticed another hero slouched against the wall. Crap, I can't carry you both. He muttered and his attention snapped back when the sound of rope tore. Stain stood, glowering at Zero. The vigilante didn't have time to get both of them out of here, so he just laid Ida back on the ground and extended his bow staff. The hero killer tilted his head. You're that vigilante, right? Zero was it? What are you doing all the way down in Hasu? He said, not making any move to attack. Zer huffed. I could say the same to you. Aren't you usually murdering people upstate? Stain rolled his eyes. There are other false heroes in different parts of Japan. I will go where I please. Are you here to kill me as well? He asked and Zero shook his head. I'm only here to save these two. But if I need to fight you to do it, then I will. Ada grunted from where he laid. Stop it. He grunted. Zero shifted, but didn't take his eyes off of Stain. His fight is with me. Get out of here, he demanded, making Zero scoff. Are you kidding me? You said it yourself that you can't even move. The only thing you'll be fighting is your death. Why are you doing this? You don't even know me. He grunted again. Zero sighed. No, I don't know you, but Aizawa does and so do your friends. Ida's eyes widened. How did he know that? If I hadn't heard that it was Aizawa's student that ran off into a fight that he can't win so carelessly, then you would be bleeding out right now. Aren't you trying to become a hero? He questioned. The ones in trouble come first before the fight. But you didn't even notice the hero, did you? Stain shifted his sword hand, making the weapon click. Zero crouched. But don't worry, I'll save you. He said and Stain sneered. You're just a child. You have no business being here. Zero tightened his grip on the staff. I'm no hero. But if someone is in trouble, I won't hesitate to get them out of harm's way. I will make it my business if it means that I can save a life. It doesn't matter if I take down small-time thugs. If others are better off without them causing trouble, then I will gladly stand in front of them. Something changed in Stain's eyes. Something like disbelief and glee. Now he was staring at Zero with the biggest grin. Fine boy. If you insist. I'll make quick work of you then. Zero only smiled underneath his mask. Just try it. Ida was so frustrated. But more than that, he was confused. This boy. This vigilante was helping him. He had heard of Zero from the media, and then his classmates when they said he was at the SG. But he never imagined that he would see him here. And he knows Aizawa? How? His teacher was the most secluded person he's ever known. Did he also know Zero? So many questions filed though his brain, but no wasn't the time to think about it. Stain hasn't even touched him yet. Zero's movements were fast and agile and his reflexes were insane. But even so, his quirk is a paralysis type. Don't let him cut you, Ida yelled at the vigilante. Zero flipped out of the way of a knife and launched himself off of the wall towards Stain's back, who spun around for another strike. Zero twisted and punched Stain's solar plexus. The hero killer wheezed and his weapons clattered to the ground. It doesn't matter how you fight. Zero swung his staff up into Stain's chin, making the man fly into the wall. Your solar plexus is always vulnerable. Stain slumped against the wall. Izuku ran back over to Ida and the pro, only to stop and collapse to the ground. Zero grunted. What? I, I can't move. Did he get me and I didn't notice? He gasped. The sleeve on his shoulder was torn with just a hint of blood. It was so shallow that it stopped bleeding almost immediately. That's it? A damn paper cut was enough for him? He growled in frustration, trying to stand back up. But it felt like his entire body was asleep. Stain walked up and stood beside him. He thought that he was going to get stabbed right there. But the killer just stared at his other two victims. And that was when he noticed it. Zero's green eyes widened at his blade. No, it's the blood. There are countless false heroes around here who are all talk. But I think you're worthy of staying alive. You're different from these two. He walked towards Ida. 
No, stop it. So begged when Stain stepped on Ida's armored back and held his jagged sword over his head. Stop. The blade sank into Ida's back. Blood sprouted from Ida's back like a fountain. The color in Zero's face slowly drained away as he watched the teenager's eyes flutter and dim. A surge of adrenaline coursed through Zero's veins, shattering the paralysis that had gripped him. With a primal roar, he leaped into action, his movements fueled by a potent mixture of rage and desperation. Zero closed the distance between himself and Stain in the blink of an eye, his fists raining down upon the villain with merciless fury. Each blow was a symphony of pain and retribution a savage reminder of the atrocities committed against the defenseless teenager and countless others. Stain lunged forward, his blade slicing through the air with deadly accuracy, but Zero dodged with lightning reflexes, narrowly avoiding the lethal strike. In response, Zero countered with a flurry of kicks and punches, each blow aimed with pinpoint accuracy at Stain's vulnerable points. Is that the best you've got, hero killer? Oh, taunted his voice dripping with disdain. I've faced tougher opponents in my sleep. His legs snapped out and kicked him out of the alley. Zero used those seconds of spare time to flip Ida over, rip off his chest plate and stab one of his new healing bullets into his flesh. He snatched his staff from the ground and ran out after the killer. As Zero launched himself at Stain, the hero killer's blade danced through the air, finding its mark with deadly accuracy. Zero's movements were swift and agile, but Stain's precision was unmatched. With a swift motion, the hero killer's blade sliced through the air, drawing blood as it grazed Zero's cheek. The sharp sting of pain ignited a fierce determination within Zero as he pressed forward, his staff swinging in a relentless assault. Stain's abnormally long tongue jutted out and towards the blade where his blood dripped, but Zero unsheathed one of his knives and threw it making the bloodied knife fly out of his hand. The man snarled and re-engaged in battle with him. But Stain was no stranger to combat, and with each passing moment, his blows grew more calculated and precise. Zero gritted his teeth against the pain as Stain's strikes found their mark, each blow leaving its mark on his body. Is that all you've got? Zero taunted, his voice laced with defiance even as blood trickled down his face. But Stain remained silent, his focus unwavering as he continued to press his advantage. With a lightning fast strike, he delivered a punishing blow to Zero's side, sending him staggering backward. Despite the pain coursing through his body, Zero refused to yield, his determination burning brighter than ever. He launched himself at Stain once more, his fists a blur as he unleashed a barrage of strikes with all the force he could muster. With one final, decisive blow, Stain struck Zero with all the force of a thunderbolt, sending him crashing to the ground in a heap. As the world spun around him, Zero fought to stay conscious, his vision swimming with pain and exhaustion. Then his body went numb for the second time that night. He groaned and his opponent stepped up over him. He breathed heavily behind his mask. Your quirk can paralyze people just by ingesting their blood. Ida and Native were down when I get here, but I was freed first. Why? He stalled. Stain's boot raised and rested on his chest, pushing air out of his lungs. All right, I have three different guesses why. Your quirk could be less effective the more people you uses it on. The amount ingested could be how long it lasts. Or there could be a difference based off a person's blood type. He raised a brow. Am I getting warmer? Zero wheezed. Another unsettling grin stretched across the man's face. So you figured it out, huh? Good job. Very impressive. The time is only limited by a person's blood type. Since you were standing again so soon after I cut you, that must mean you're typo right. He deducted and Zero wiggled his toes, feeling starting to come back. Stain rested his jagged sword underneath his chin, making a bead of blood swell underneath it. The word hero has lost all meaning in this society. The world is overrun by criminals and fakes who chase petty dreams. But you are not one of those people. I've read about you. A while back, you yourself tried to kill a hero, but he ended up escaping. After that, there was no incident of you ever harming another. Why? 
He lifted the foot from his chest, letting him suck in the precious air into his deflated lungs. He coughed, glaring at the man. Zepter killed my mother. I thought it was only fair that he die in return. But another hero stopped me. After that I realized that killing him wouldn't bring her back. I'm not a killer. I'm not like you. He hissed and Zero jumped up, kicking Stain in the chest and knocking him onto his back. His sword slid across the deserted road and Zero took that moment to jump on top of him, punching in until he was unconscious. He breathed heavily, stumbling off his limp body and collected any weapons he found on his body. Then he walked back into the alley, deciding to test his luck with the trash. During his dumpster diving, he surprisingly found good quality rope that looked like it had never even been used. Zero didn't dwell on it long though. He had something to tie Stain up, that was enough for him. After accomplishing his task, he returned to the two victims' sides. Zo sighed with relief when he found both of them still breathing. He had never had the time to test his bullets out, so he had no idea if it would work. But given the fact that the wound on Ida's back had closed, it worked. The only problem was his blood loss. If he didn't get to the hospital and a transfusion, he won't make it. There was nothing else he could do though. He was forced to wait for another few minutes before police sirens came into range, getting closer by the second. It was only when he saw the flashing lights that he stumbled up the fire escape and onto the roof, staying out of sight and using the rest of his energy to heal his own injuries before blacking out. He never saw the two individuals on a water tower, one covered with swirling purple mist and the other shaking with rage. Aizawa stared at his student with glaring red eyes. He didn't even need to say anything. His dark look explained all of his disappointment. Ida fisted the sheets with his bandaged hands. You're lucky that the police showed up when they did, or you would have been killed. Ida winced and Detective Tsukachi cleared his throat, and Aizawa's menacing aura disappeared. Tenya, what can you tell me about your encounter with Stain? Do you know who defeated him? We would like to find out which pro it was. Ada looked up at that. It wasn't a pro, he said, making the two adults more attentive. It was that vigilante that was at the Yasuji. Zero. He was also down in Hasu. I think I blacked out though because I don't remember much. One minute he was on the ground, and then he was walking away. He looked pretty injured too. Aizawa's fingers twitched by his side and Sukachi's side. I should have known, but what was he doing down in Hasu anyway? That is not his normal route. Did you see where he went? If he's injured, then we should try to find him as soon as possible. He could already be. Sakachi winced and glanced at Aizawa, who looked just about ready to combust. He laid a hand on his shoulder and nodded his head when he looked up. Go find him. The tired teacher calmly opened the hospital door and walked out. But as soon as he stepped out of the hospital, he was flying across the city and back to the crime scene. It's warm. Izuku peeled his heavy eyes open and stared up at a blurry scruffy familiar face. When his vision cleared, he realized that he was still on top of the roof in Hasu and lying against Aizawa. Oh, hey Eraser, he rasped. What happened? You fought Stain. And as much as I want to scold you for picking a fight with him, I'm also grateful. Thank you for saving my student, and I'm so glad that you're okay. He said softly, keeping Izuku close to his chest. Izuku closed his eyes. Aizawa's coffee and smoky smell was safe. He was home. What were you doing in Hasu anyway? Izuku's cheeks tinted a light red. I, uh, will I knew that the hero killer was down in Hasu so I, he stammered and Aizawa's face darkened. You knowingly went to face the hero killer, he asked calmly and Izuku squeaked. I was going to take him down from a distance, but then your student got in the way. I had to. He played with his fingers. Aizawa ran his hand through his hair. Midoriya, you shouldn't have even been in the same town as him, let alone fight, he sighed. Problem children, all of you. He murmured under his breath. Izuku's lips twitched and he reached up to pluck a hair from Aizawa's head. The man turned to face him and Izuku smirked, 
holding up a gray hair. Aizawa's black eye twitched, and he activated his quirk, making his hair float. Kid. He growled and Izuku yelped in terror. Three days later, Izuku was back on his feet and patrolling with Aizawa. Crime has been pretty low lately, so they would mostly call it spending time together. Tonight though, Izuku was on his own. Aizawa needed a much-needed break, so the boy could only assume that he was sleeping. It was fine. He saw the bags that looked like they were being held down by weights underneath the hero's eyes. Izuku hoped that he was getting all of the sleep he could get. He couldn't help but miss him though. It's been a while since they haven't patrolled together, and Izuku was lonely. He sighed as he walked down the quiet streets of Tokyo. Well, I guess there will be no crime stopping tonight. Zero swung the strap of blackout over his head and let it rest on his back as he turned to go back to his warehouse. However, there was someone blocking his path. He stopped, hands itching to the blades on his thighs. Several tense moments passed before the man put his hands up and stepped out of the shadows. Zero's brows lifted in surprise as the boy approached him with a solemn look. Tenya Ida. Good to see you on your feet. What are you doing on the streets at? He glanced at his watch. 1.30 in the morning. Ida swallowed. Please. He started. My brother is hurt. I heard that your quirk has advanced healing abilities. He'll never be able to walk again. He was close to tears. He'll never be a hero again. Please help him. I know you don't owe me anything, especially after what happened with Stain, but I will do anything if it means you will help him. Nothing but the barking of dogs broke the heavy silence between them. Zero stared at his broken-hearted face and sighed. You don't know me. Yet you're trusting that I will help your brother instead of just ending his suffering. I've read about you. You may be a vigilante, but you help the innocent. You heal their injuries. You healed Mr. Aizawa in a day, and he came out without a scratch. You healed me when you could have just left me to die. You help the heroes. I don't help your so-called heroes. Zero spat, shocking Ida. I only help the civilians they put in danger. Staying crippled and murdered innocents. He killed heroes who had families and people who loved them. They were good people but they only became heroes for the money and fame. I don't like how he went about doing it, but I agree with Stain's ideology. His eyes softened underneath his hood. I used to adore heroes. Ingenium was one of them. I'm sorry, but I can't help you. Zero walked past him. Mr. Azawa is a hero though. Ida said softly, making him stop. What's different about him? I wasn't there but my classmates told me that you protected him from the Namu, and you seemed protective of him. Is he your father or something? He asked and Zero closed his eyes. He was his father in everything but blood. Although he wasn't sure if Aizawa felt the same, he couldn't imagine what he would do if he lost him. He already lost his mother, and it almost killed him. That was a feeling Izuku never wanted to have again. Ida was just scared. He was still a teenager, and sometimes Izuku forgot that he was too. Zero opened his eyes and slouched in defeat. Come with me. He said and walked away, not bothering to look over his shoulder to know that Ida was following. Zero poured the hot water into the porcelain mugs and dipped the tea pouches inside. He placed one in front of Ida and leaned against the counter, cupping the steaming drink between his gloved hands. He knew that Ida could be trusted, but he wasn't going to give up his identity. Izuku Midoriya was still legally dead. Tell me about your brother, he said. And Ida glanced up from where he was nursing the tea. He cleared his throat and sat up straighter. My brother is an unmatched commander who... I didn't ask about Ingenium. Zero interrupted. I asked about your brother. I know who Ingenium is but nothing about Tensei Ida. Ida blinked. Oh. He started again. He is a beacon of discipline, a paragon of responsibility, and an embodiment of unwavering determination. From a young age, my brother displayed an exemplary commitment to justice and order, a trait that has only strengthened over the years. 
Tenya's eyes light up as he recounts his brother's accomplishments, each achievement a testament to an indomitable spirit. In both academics and heroics, my brother has soared to unparalleled heights. His dedication to excellence is truly unparalleled, serving as an inspiration not just to me, but to all who have the privilege of knowing him. Whether it's leading by example in the field or guiding others with sagacious counsel, he stands as a paragon of virtue. As he continues, Tenya's words paint a vivid portrait of his brother's character. Beyond his formidable abilities, my brother possesses an innate kindness and empathy that defines true heroism. He approaches challenges not with arrogance, but with a genuine desire to make a positive impact on the world. His humility is a beacon that guides us all, reminding us that even the mightiest heroes are, at their core, driven by compassion. Tenya concludes with a note of profound gratitude. I am privileged to have such an incredible brother. He not only molds the world into a better place through his heroic deeds, but also shapes the hearts of those around him. In every sense, my brother is a beacon of inspiration, a living testament to the potential for greatness within us all. Ida talked about his brother with passion that it made Zero smile. He doesn't think that he's ever heard someone speak with such admiration. Zero's chest expanded with the deep breath he took. It's too late tonight, he said softly. Ida's head snapped up, hope shining in his eyes. You can crash here, then head home in the morning. The hospital window, partially ajar, beckoned to Zero as he scaled the hospital's wall. With a careful and calculated motion, Zero slipped into the room, the darkness concealing their presence. The soft rustle of the curtains masked any sound, ensuring a seamless entry. Moonlight filtered through the room, revealing Tensei's weakened form. His labored breathing spoke of the struggles he faced, and Zero felt a surge of determination to aid in his recovery. He stepped up next to the injured hero and held his hands over his body, and let his quirk take over. He was surprised when his hands were encased in glowing dark gray. Any longer, then the doctors would have definitely lost him. It took three hours for his hands to turn green. Zero let go of his power and shakily sat in the chair next to the bed to catch his breath. Another ten minutes and Tensei was groaning and moving his legs. Tensei Ida blinked his eyes open, looking disoriently around the dark room. It took him a couple seconds to remember where he was and instinctively tried moving his legs out of habit. Only, he didn't expect the muscles to tense and slightly bend. Eyes wide with disbelief, Tensei gingerly sat up with a strength he didn't have before, his gaze sweeping across the room. It was then that he saw the figure in black standing in the corner, a silent guardian with a presence both enigmatic and comforting. Hello? Tensei uttered, his voice hesitant. The masked figure acknowledged his awakening with a nod. Though his features were concealed, the sense of reassurance emanating from him was palpable. You, you healed me, Tensei marveled, his eyes reflecting the astonishment of a hero granted a second chance. His silent affirmation spoke volumes, confirming the unspoken bond forged in the quiet hours of the night. Tensei swung his legs over the side of the bed, testing their newfound strength with a sense of awe. A hand landed on his shoulder, and Tensei's head shot up. He hadn't even heard the guy move. Zero started pushing him back down. Don't try to stand, okay? My quirk fixed up your legs, but your injury was pretty bad. Sorry, but standing's a no-go for at least six months. Do some leg stretches to keep him in shape. And only after that half a year, you can give walking a shot. Vitakinesis is touchy stuff. You gotta listen in genium, or I won't be able to help you next time. Oh and I would appreciate you not telling anyone about this. No one knows what my quirk is, and I would like to keep it that way. Zero explained, sounding way younger than Tensei expected. Tensei blinked, processing the info. You the vigilante Zero? He asked cautiously, letting himself be pushed back onto the bed. Zero didn't say anything, just moved back to the window. Don't let the doctors convince you otherwise. They might push you into physical therapy. Seriously, for your brother's sake, trust me on this. No therapy for six months. 
Zero insisted quietly. Then he climbed out of the window and dropped down, leaving Tensei to mull over his first run-in with the infamous vigilante. I didn't get to say thank you. Aizawa grew curious when Izuku said that he wasn't going to make it to their scheduled meetings and patrols. His texts were sloppy and slurred, almost like he was typing and falling asleep at the same time. He didn't think much of it. Aizawa didn't want to crowd the kid and show up unannounced. But that was before he saw the news. Hero Ingenium released from hospital after miracle cure. Aizawa and Hazashi had watched the retired hero wheeled out of the hospital with Tenya and his parents. They watched Tensei's doctor give the reporters their perspective of what happened. On Tuesday, Mr. Ida's condition was dire. He couldn't move his body at all. However, to our utter amazement, overnight, there was a miraculous transformation. His injuries appeared to have healed completely, except for the residual difficulty he would face in walking. We were initially baffled by this sudden turnaround, but it was evident that something extraordinary had occurred. Despite the remarkable recovery, it was clear that Mr. Ida would require ongoing care and rehabilitation, particularly to regain his ability to walk. We recommended physical therapy as a crucial step in his recovery process. However, much to our disappointment, Mr. Ida declined our suggestion. Our hospital boasts a team of highly skilled doctors and nurses, each equipped with unique healing quirks. However, even with our advanced medical capabilities, none of us could explain or replicate the inexplicable recovery Mr. Ida experienced. It was a medical mystery that left us both astonished and frustrated, as we were eager to assist him further on his journey toward full recovery. Despite his reluctance for physical therapy, we remained hopeful that with time and perseverance, Mr. Ida would eventually overcome the challenges he faced in walking. We stood ready to provide support and guidance every step of the way, trusting in his resilience and determination to overcome this extraordinary ordeal. The two men sighed in unison, not needing to think hard on just who helped him. That's why he hasn't been showing up. He used up his energy to heal Tensei. Aizawa said, rubbing his face. Why though? He asked, mostly to himself, then looked at Hizashi. Just when I begin to get all of the answers to my questions, he hits me with more. He stood and paced. He said that he didn't like heroes, yet he healed Ingenium. Why? Aizawa grabbed his capture weapon and dropped it over his head, slipping his black boots on. Are you going to see Midoriya? Hizashi asked from the couch. Aizawa shook his head. No, he might still be asleep, and I don't want to disturb him. I'm going to see Tensei to get the full story. I have a feeling that Ida had something to do with this. He closed the door behind him. His student was the one to answer the door when Aizawa knocked. He was amused by the way his eyes widened, and how much he straightened when he saw him on the doorstep. Mr. Aizawa, what brings you here? He stepped aside letting the man walk into the spacious home. Are your parents home? He asked and Ida shook his head, adjusting his glasses. No, they'll be out for another couple hours. He said and Aizawa hummed. What about your brother? Just as Ida opened his mouth, Tensei wheeled in. Tenya, who's at the... He smiled when he saw his friend. Shouta, good to see you. He stopped in front of him and held out his hand. It's been a while. Aizawa nodded and grasped his hand in a shake. You as well. I'm glad that you are out of the hospital. I actually came for that reason. If you have time, I would like to speak with the both of you. He said. Both brothers glanced at each other and Tensei nodded. Yes, of course. He spun his wheelchair around and lead him to their living room. The teacher took a seat on the opposite side of where Ida and Tensei resided. Ida cleared his throat. Would you like anything to drink, Mr. Shizaizawa? He asked, and the man shook his head. I shouldn't be here for very long. I just need to ask some questions about how you got healed. Both of them stiffened and Tensei's kind smile strained. Aizawa leaned forward on his knees. Don't worry. I know about Zero and his quirk, so you won't be betraying his trust or anything. The retired hero blinked but slouched in relief. 
Then Aizawa turned to his student. Ida, I would like to ask, were you a part of this? The teenager gulped and Tensei looked at his brother with furrowed brows. Ida sighed. I went out looking for Zero a few nights ago and asked him to help. He confessed and Aizawa leaned back. And what did he say? Zero is not a fan of heroes. He's a good guy. But I don't think he would spontaneously heal an injured hero. I've been working with him for about two years and I'm trying to understand why. Ida took a deep breath. At first, he wasn't going to do it. He seemed kind of mad when I asked him. Told me that he doesn't help the so-called heroes. Only the civilians that they put in danger. But I thought that since he healed you, he could also heal Tensei. Aizawa nodded once and set his attention on his friend. I need to ask. Did he tell you not to do physical therapy? He asked, and the man nodded again. He told me to not try walking for six months, just to do some stretches to keep them flexible. It seemed very important. He relayed. May I ask why he helped if he is against heroes? His friend was quiet for a time. All I can tell you is that he doesn't believe in them anymore. That they failed him while he was growing up. Tensei frowned, pity flashing through his eyes. I see. But then why does he work with you? The corner of his lips tilted up behind his scarf. He told me that I was, he made air quotes, immune from his hatred. Tensei let a soft chuckle release. Good. I'm glad that he has you. His smile sobered. Shouda, how old is he? He sounded so young. Around ten years age really. Should he really be doing this? Aizawa rubbed the back of his head. I couldn't stop him if I tried. He would probably stay away from me if I did. But don't worry, he can handle himself just fine. He stood, finally having everything cleared up and turned his intimidating gaze to his student. Ida. The boy snapped to attention. I would very much appreciate that you don't pursue him again for the use of his quirk. Zero is very sensitive about heroes. Nobody knows who he is or what his quirk can do. It needs to stay that way. Tenya was already nodding. Of course. He jumped up. I'll see you out. The boy walked out. Aizawa shook Tensei's hand again. It was good to see you, Shouda. Please tell Zero thank you for me the next time you see him. I will. As said, Ida was standing next to the open door. Mr. Aizawa, may I accompany you the next time you see Zero? I would like to thank him in person. Aizawa hummed. I'll let you know. He simply said and walked out the door. The cityscape stretched before them, its sprawling complexity a testament to the challenges that heroes and vigilantes faced. Aizawa's gaze remained fixed ahead but his mind churned with thoughts about the enigmatic figure walking beside him. I know you had a hand in Tensei Ida's recovery. The precision of your quirk usage isn't something easily missed. Aizawa suddenly said. Zero winced, but didn't say anything. Zero, healing quirks aren't something to be taken lightly. They come with their own set of risks and consequences, Aizawa continued, his tone unwavering. You might have helped in Genium but you need to understand the implications of what you're doing. Heroes have rules, even if they might seem inconvenient at times. Zero turned his masked face toward Aizawa, the moonlight catching the edges of his silhouette. Rules can be limiting. Sometimes, unconventional methods are necessary. Zero replied cryptically. Aizawa's frown deepened, an unspoken disagreement lingering in the air. The road you're on is a dangerous one. You may have good intentions, but that doesn't guarantee a positive outcome. Keep that in mind. Aizawa's stern expression softened for a moment, acknowledging the truth in those words. Just be cautious. I don't want you to get in a situation that you can't get out of. He warned before nodding toward the direction of the approaching dawn. I'm heading back. Stay sharp. Zero merely inclined his head in acknowledgement, and with that, Aizawa and Zero parted ways, each disappearing into the shadows that had become their domain. As the night settled into a calm stillness, and the streets remained devoid of crime, Zero found himself standing on a rooftop, 
overlooking the city. Just as the tranquility began to seep in, a sudden commotion reached his ears. Down below, a little girl with long, white hair darted through the streets, pursued by two figures donning ominous bird masks. Without a moment's hesitation, Zero leaped into action, his form melding seamlessly with the darkness as they descended to the streets below. Stepping into the alley, just as the pursued child dashed past. His gloved hand shot out and dragged the frightened girl into the protective shadows. The masked figures slowed down in front of the alley. Where did she go? One of them whispered, sounding panicked. If boss finds out she's gone, he's going to. Shut up, the other hissed. In the shelter of the alley, Zero crouched down, maintaining a tight but reassuring grip on the girl. The little one, wide-eyed and scared, looked up at the enigmatic figure with naked fear and shaking head to two, gripping onto the hand that was keeping her mouth obscured. It's HH, you're safe now, Zero whispered softly, their voice a soothing melody in the midst of chaos. He focused his attention back onto the two men. She couldn't have gotten far. The man looked around the streets for the girl in Zero's arms, her trembling body practically vibrating from fear. Zo tensed as their masked faces swiveled around. One of them finally huffed. Come on, let's keep looking. With that, they both ran and Zero waited until their footsteps faded before he loosed his grip on the terrified child, twisting her around gently to face him. The poor girl's red eyes were swimming in tears. Zero's intimidating presence dropped, and he lowered his hood and mask, revealing Izuku's smile. Hello. Sorry if I scared you. I really am trying to help. My name is Izuku. What's yours? He said quietly, and the girl sniffled, wiping at her pale face. Izuku's eyes flicked up, just noticing the small horn protruding in the corner of her forehead. E Eri? She whimpered. Well, it's very nice to meet you, Eri. He said with such lightness that her trembling started to ease. He looked at her appearance and barely reigned in the disgust at the sight of the old rags that hung off her skinny from and the freshly wrapped bandages on her arms and legs. What do you say we get you out of here? I'll take you to a safe place, I promise. He reassured. After a few seconds, the little girl nodded. Can I pick you up? Or do you want to walk? Another moment of hesitation before the girl lifted her arms. Izuku smiled readjusting his mask and head before gently picking her up and hold her against his chest. She's so light. Zo peeked out of the alley for the two men before going in the opposite direction. Little by little, Eri's tension started to dissipate while Zero talked to her cheerfully, realizing that she was safe now. She would respond to some of his easy questions with no more the three words. When he finally reached his warehouse, he reached for his grappling hook and held it up over his head. Hold on tight. When she got a more secure hold, Zero pulled the trigger, and the hook wedged into the open window sill. He pressed the button on the back of the gun, and let his body fly up and through the window. Eri squeaked with surprise and Zero landed inside the darkness of his sanctuary. He walked in further, having memorized the layout and right to the light switch. Christmas lights flickered on, lighting up the dark space, and giving it a more welcoming presence. He walked to his nest of pillows and blankets, setting Eri down on its soft surface. She watched him owlishly as he walked towards the big wardrobe against the wall, slipping Blackout's case off his shoulders and sliding it on the bottom shelf. He stripped off his vigilante uniform, using the swinging door to change behind into shorts and a t-shirt. When he finished, he closed the double doors and walked up to her loosely non-threatening. When he got in front of her, he kneeled down and held out his hands. Can I touch you? The girl swallowed apprehensively, but shakily brought her arms up. Izuku, still holding that easygoing smile, carefully unwrapping the bandages. The smile wavered when he saw all of the surgical wounds and scars, both old and new. He almost tightened his grip and scowled in disgust but he managed to maintain an unjudgmental face. He looked up, into her teary red eyes. Would you like me to heal them? I have a quirk called vitakinesis. These will be gone in no time. Several seconds pass, 
Eri looking back and forth between her arms and Izuku. He waits patiently, giving her time to answer. Soon after, she nodded so small that Izuku almost didn't see it. This won't hurt, I promise. Keeping one hand around her elbow, he held the other over her frail arm, and Eri gasped at the soft yellow glow that encased his hands. She watched the scars on her arm shrink until it was smooth skin. Once his hands turned green, Izuku moved onto her other arm, unwrapping the bandages and healing her arm. Her legs were the exact same. Iri relaxed five minutes later, when the last of her scars were healed. Izuku blinked slowly. He didn't use enough energy to make him want to sleep. But he still felt drowsy. Izuku grinned. So, what would you like to eat? Iri's transition to living with Izuku in his hideout was a delicate process, marked by both uncertainty and hope. The small, tucked-away space became a haven where she could begin to rebuild her life away from the haunting memories of her past. At first, the hideout felt foreign to Eri, its confined quarters a stark contrast to the oppressive atmosphere she had endured under overhaul. However, Izuku went out of his way to create a warm and comforting environment. The walls adorned with simple decorations and makeshift curtains softened the edges of the concrete surroundings. Izuku took the time to introduce Eri to the routine of their daily life a routine built on trust and understanding. He patiently explained the purpose of each room and the significance of their shared space. Ira, initially reserved and cautious, began to open up as she realized that she was now free to explore and make choices for herself. One of the first challenges was adjusting to a sense of normalcy. Izuku encouraged her to express her preferences and opinions, whether it was choosing what to eat for dinner or deciding on a bedtime story. Slowly, Eri found her voice, the hesitancy giving way to a newfound confidence. The hideout, once an unfamiliar refuge, transformed into a place where Eri could rediscover joy and innocence. Simple pleasures like reading books, playing games, and sharing meals became cherished moments. Izuku's patient guidance and unwavering support fostered an atmosphere of safety and acceptance. Eri. I'm back, Izuku called out, his voice echoing all around him. The six-year-old has been staying with him for about a week now and Izuku had let her get accustomed to living with him before going out for supplies and only waiting until she was asleep before leaving for patrol with a racer head. Final exams for Yue were approaching fast and as promised, Izuku had worked on his notebooks so they would be prepared when the students went on their summer training camp. Izuku set the grocery bags down on the table in the back of the warehouse, looking for the girl he deemed his little sister. A white head peeked out from underneath his blanket nest, and he smiled sadly, kneeling next to her. Hey, have you been underneath there the whole time? He asked gently, taking the corner of the soft fabric and removing it from her face. Uri swallowed and nodded. I missed you. She murmured quietly. The boy's smile widened. Yeah, well I missed you too, he confessed. I'll take you the next time I go out, yeah? He stood to grab a plastic bag before settling down next to her and pulled out a reed beach hat, some transparent glasses and a white long sleeve button shirt, black leggings with light brown boots and a cute red dress with a over-the-head purse. You can't stay cooped up in here forever and overhaul is still out there. So what do you think of a little makeover? He wriggled his eyebrows. Iri's red eyes glimmered at the suggestion, but didn't smile. Izuku had tried jokes, to dumb puns to get her to smile, but nothing worked. He was determined to ever since she tried to smile by pulling her lips up with her fingers to mimic him, instead of just using the facial muscles she didn't have. A faint, vibrating sound came from the dinner table. Izuku left Iri with his findings to answer his phone. Ketsawa. Izuku pressed the green button and placed it against his ear, twisting to lean against the counter, and watched Iri carefully pick at the new sets of clothes. Hello, you've reached the Midoriya Comedy Hotline. For bad jokes and terrible puns, press 1. If you want to hear me talk about how funny I am, press 2. For all other vigilante-related matters, press 3. How can I make you laugh today, Mr. Aizawa? Utter silence greeted him, 
and his smile twitched to contain the laugh that bubbled in his throat. And then he heard the most exhausted sigh ever created, and could never be replicated by any other man. No, Midoriya, I called to discuss something important. Can you please be serious for a moment? Serious? Me? Never, Izuku replied with a chuckle. But sure, shoot. I'm all ears. Aizawa muttered something about dealing with impossible problem children. But despite his grumbling, there was a subtle hint of amusement in his tone as they continued the conversation. As you know, Class A and B are going to the summer training camp next week, and I want you to come with us. Izuku's smile slowly fell, and he bit his lip. He hasn't told Aizawa about Eri yet. Ah yeah. He cleared his throat and Aizawa put his foot down. Look kid, I don't want to leave you alone. It's a training camp, but there are going to be some fun activities too. Uh, in case you've forgotten, I am a vigilante and nobody knows who I am or my age. Plus, I won't be alone. He said and smiled when Eri looked his way with the red hat that covered her horn. It had started to shrink the longer he stayed with him. Eri had told him what her quirk was and was startled when she had the power to rewind. Ever since then, he's been researching and finding out possible training methods. You're not alone. Who's with you? Izuku swallowed. I saved a little girl last week. She's been staying with me since. More silence from the pro. He lowered his voice to a whisper so Eri wouldn't hear. She was held captive for who knows how long and was tortured. She doesn't have anyone else to go to. And you didn't tell me because, he said, voice low and threatening. He wasn't even here and Izuku started to sweat. He didn't need to be there to know that the man had activated his erasure quirk. Look, I'm barely starting to get her to trust me. I didn't want you to come and startle her. I can't just leave her here. Aizawa sighed. Can I come over now? I'd like to meet her. Maybe I can pull some ropes and she can come with us. Izuku hesitated. He laid his phone on his shoulder. Eerie? He said gently, and the girl's head tilted to the side. A friend of mine would like to meet you. Do you think you can too? I promise that he won't hurt you. That nervous apprehension flashed through her eyes, but she nodded nonetheless. Izuku smiled and placed the phone back over his ear. Yeah, sure. We'll be here. Thankfully, Aizawa had texted him that he was here instead of jumping through the window like usual. So after letting Iri know he was here, he stood up with her behind his leg and let Aizawa know that he could come in. Aizawa, welcome, Izuku greeted, glancing between Aizawa and Iri. This is Iri. Iri, meet my mentor, Eraserhead. Iri, a bit shy but curious, offered a small wave. Hello, Eraserhead. Aizawa inclined his head in acknowledgement. Iri, Midoriya, we need to talk. As Aizawa and Izuku moved to a corner for a private conversation, Eri remained near the center of the room, unsure of whether to continue her activities or not. Aizawa, noting her uncertainty, decided to approach her directly after exchanging a few words with Izuku. Hello, Eri. Midoriya told me a bit about you, Aizawa said in his usual monotone voice. How are you adjusting to life here? Eri, with a hint of hesitation, replied, it's nice. Izuku takes care of me. Aizawa nodded. Good to know. If you ever need anything or have any concerns, don't hesitate to let me or Midoriya know. We're here to help. The tension left Eri's body at that, her trust in Izuku extending to his mentor. Thank you, Eraserhead. Aizawa returned to his conversation with Izuku, but not before casting a discerning gaze around the hideout evaluating the suitability of the environment for Eri. As the mentor and student discussed matters related to the upcoming training camp, Eri continued her activities, gradually warming up to the idea of Aizawa's presence in their lives. You don't need to reveal your identity. That's not what I'm trying to say. You have an eye when it comes to quirk analysis like no one I've ever seen. Not even Nezu. And you can just give the notebooks to them yourself. Izuku scratched his head, not noticing Aizawa examining the orange and black weaved bracelet. 
You're not going to stop until I say yes, huh? His clear answer was the lift of Aizawa's eyebrow, making Izuku sign and turn to his little sister. Eri? How would you feel about going on a camping trip? In the dimly lit room, Katsuki Bakugo lay on his bed, the weight of the upcoming summer training camp hanging in the air. The anticipation and anxiety stirred within him, creating a turbulent sea of emotions. His mind involuntarily drifted to thoughts of Izuku Midoriya, his former friend, whose absence left an indelible mark on Katsuki's conscience. Fingers absent-mindedly traced the woven black and green bracelet that adorned Katsuki's wrist. It was a memento from the past, a token of a friendship that had once burned bright, but was now tinged with sorrow. The colors of the bracelet were a silent tribute to the unique bond they had shared the fierce rivalry and the camaraderie that had defined their relationship. As he stared at the ceiling, memories of Izuku's determination, his unwavering spirit played like a haunting reel in Katsuki's mind. A flicker of regret touched his features a sentiment rarely visible on the explosive teenager's face. Why the hell did it have to end like this, Deku? Katsuki muttered to the empty room, the words carrying a weight of unresolved emotions. The summer training camp loomed ahead, a stark reminder of the challenges they would face, but also a cruel reminder that Izuku would not be there to share the burden. In the solitude of the night, Bakugo found himself grappling with conflicting emotions the desire to surpass his own limits, and the unspoken yearning for the presence of a rival who had once been his closest confidant. The bracelet, intertwined with memories and regrets, became a tangible link to the past. As the night wore on, Katsuki's thoughts remained entangled with the ghost of his past friendship, and he clutched the woven bracelet tighter, as if holding onto a fragment of a time when the future seemed limitless and the world hadn't been tainted by loss. The impending dawn brought with it the promise of a new day, but for Katsuki, the shadows of the night lingered, casting a silent pall over the room and the memories he couldn't escape. Now that you've finished your first semester at Yua High, it's time for summer break to officially begin. However, don't think this will be months of rest for you heroes in training. At this camp, we'll push you to go beyond your limits. You're aiming to become plus ultra. Aizawa said to his students tiredly, Yes, sir. Just as he saw them about to burst with excitement, he hit them with one more surprise. By the way, those three words made them all tense. Someone will be joining us. He will help you point out any weaknesses and what to focus on. The students started to murmur to each other and Aizawa's eyes flicked up to where Zero was crouching on top of the bus. He raised an eyebrow at Gyro who didn't seem to have heard him. Um, who is it, Mr. Aizawa? The teacher only glanced up at Zero again, prompting the rest of them to as well. Most of them gasping at the vigilante. He scanned them all with a scrutinizing gaze and shifted, making the assembled sniper on his back move as well. Zero will be assisting myself, Vlad King, and the pro heroes we will be meeting at the camp. Aizawa nodded at his teenage partner and he jumped behind the bus, coming around a few seconds later with Iri clutching his hand, the beach hat shadowing her face. The girls squealed at the shy girl as the two of them came to a stop next to Aizawa. Movement caught his eye, and he noticed Minoru Maita inching towards the two of them. He was salivating at the six-year-old beside him. Zero's eyes widened in anger, and he caught a bit of what he was saying. Gonna look so good when she's older. Oh, Mainta, Kirishima said hesitantly, glancing at the furious teenager to his classmate. Eri tightening her grasp on his pant leg was enough for him to reach back. The entire class gasped and Mainta's eyes crossed at the barrel of blackout against his forehead. The boy shrieked and fell on his ass. Zero's lightning green eyes flashed. What did you say? He murmured so deathly quiet that everyone's danger instincts shot through the roof. You're here to become a hero, not to indulge your pathetic desires. Keep your perverted antics away from my little sister, or you'll find out just how unpleasant dealing with me can be, he said. Understand. Minta nodded, eyes wet. Zero narrowed his eyes and slung blackout across his back, laying a comforting hand on Eri's head. 
Minda scurried behind Kaminari, as if he'd protect him. Several tense seconds later, Aizawa got their attention again. All right, everyone, find your seats, we're leaving. Zero pulled out his phone and gave it to Iri to entertain her for the duration of the trip when they sat down next to Aizawa. As soon as the bus was out of Yua, chaos had erupted. Students were talking, yelling, and standing. I can't believe with your track record of expelling students, you haven't kicked that little asshole out of Yue for good. Zero said, eyes not leaving Iri's white head. Aizawa sighed next to him. I know about his habits, and I've been keeping a close eye on him. Believe me when I say he really has shown potential in being a hero. Zero rolled his eyes. Yeah, sure. One hour later, the bus stopped and pulled over onto a flat piece of land on the side of the road. Students piled out, stretching and Minta was scrabbling around. And they also noticed the car parked there, seemingly waiting for them. Zero and Iri walked off as well with the latter rubbing her eye. You don't really think we stopped here just so you could stretch your legs to you? Aizawa said, hands in his pockets and Minter ran up to them. Please sir, the bathroom. The door to the parked car opened. Haya Eraser. Two women, dressed in pink and blue cat costumes, stepped out. Aizawa bowed. Long time, no see. Zero hummed. Ah, the wild, wild pussy cats. Your feline fantasies are here, say meow. Perfectly cute cat-like girls. You can call us the wild, wild pussycats. The women said simultaneously, and a little boy stepped up next to them. These are the pro heroes you'll be working with at the summer training camp. So sighed quietly. Sure they were very kind people, but his distaste for heroes still stands so he couldn't help it. The woman in the pink cat costume pointed over the railing. We own this whole stretch of land out here. Everything you can see. All the way down there with the training camp, you'll be staying at is there, at the base of the mountain. Ooh, then why do we stop all the way out here? Everyone started to sweat and smile nervously. That can't be right. Back on the bus quick. We should go. Good idea. Load up. The cat woman in pink smiled evilly, tail wagging behind her. The current time is 9.30 in the morning. If you're fast about it, you might make it there by noon. No way. The students all ran back to the bus. Kitties who don't make it there by 12.30 won't get any lunch. You should have guessed students. The training camp. The cat woman in blue jumped in front of them with a smirk. Has already started. The pro laid her palms on the ground. They glowed before the ground exploded, and they all slipped off the cliff, screaming. Good news. Since this is private land, you can all use your quirks as much as you want to. You've got three full hours. You should be able to make it to the facility in that time. That is, if you can get through the beast's forest. The hero in blue spun around to Zero, who raised his brows. What's this little kitty still doing up here? She started to walk forward with her hands out. Pixie Bob. She giggled and reached, but Zero grabbed her wrist. Touch me, and the only thing you'll be feeling is a broken jaw. He threatened, making the hero's smile drop. Aizawa put a hand on his shoulder. This is Zero. He's not a student here. He's going to be helping us train the students. Wait, I've heard of you. The hero in pink walked up to them. You're that vigilante, right? You help the heroes? Zero's lips curled at that, and he grasped Iri's hand before walking back to the bus, leaving her with wide eyes of confusion. Aizawa sighed. He doesn't like heroes very much. He confessed an understanding lit Mandalay's eyes. What happened? She said softly. They took away someone very important to him. With that, he walked back to the bus. Didn't you say it was only going to take them three hours? O said. It's been nine. Mandalay rubbed her head. Well, it took us three hours to get back so, she smiled sheepishly. It's fine. I never said it was going to be easy. Aizawa said, blinking tiredly. Zero chuckled. But you're going to wake them up at seven, and you have remedial classes with the ones that fail the exam. 
That's a little cruel, don't you think? Aizawa raised his eyebrow. Like I said, not easy. This is a walk in the park compared to what they have to do when they become pros. Zero shrugged. A hand squeezed his, and he looked at Arai. What's up, Eri? He kneeled down to her height. She looked to the right. Who's that? She whispered and Izuku followed her line of sight, where a boy around her age stood with his hands stuffed in his pockets. Zero tilted his head. This was the first time he had seen him. I'm not sure. Why don't you go say hi? He suggested and Iri bit her lip, so Zero gently pushed her. Go on. Iri nodded and shuffled over to him. He's actually my cousin's son. Mandalay said. He just lives with us now. Her expression saddened. Two years ago, Koda's parents were protecting citizens from a villain, and they didn't survive. For a hero, it was a respectable way to die an honorable death. But a child barely aware of what was around him couldn't understand that. His whole world had revolved around his parents. To him, all he thought were his parents leaving him behind. Society kept praising them, saying it was a good thing for heroes, a wonderful thing. He doesn't seem to like us much either, since we're also heroes. But it's like he's just here, because there's nowhere else for him to go. Dakota, heroes are a kind of human he can't understand and finds unpleasant. She smiled at her second cousin when he blushed when Eri spoke to him. She's adorable. What's her name? Zero smiled too, when the two kids started to talk. Eri, I rescued her a couple of weeks ago, and she's been staying with me since. Heavily panting reached their ears, as the students started filing out of the forest, scrapes and bruises littering their bodies. Zero's eyes focused on his old friend, who was looking just as exhausted. Some of them collapsed when they made it into the clearing. You said it would only take like three hours, Zero complained. I guess we timed it by how long it would take us, sorry. Mandalay said, not sounding very sincere. I'm starving. This is hell. Meow 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 meow. I thought it would take you kittens even longer. But you did much better against my dirt monsters than I thought you would. You guys were seriously great. Especially the three of you. She pointed to Katsuki, Todoroki, and Ida. It seems like you've had quite a bit of experience. She licked her lips and lunged at them. I call these dibs on these kittens, I'll groom them myself. She danced around them. Mandalay, has she always been like this? Aizawa asked, and she shrugged. It's gotten worse lately, she's at the age to take a mate. Zero scrunched his nose. Um, no disrespect. But isn't she in her thirties? Mandalay winced. Yuriraka walked up to the two children by the building. Hi there, my name is Yuriraka. What's yours? She asked with a friendly smile. Koda huffed and walked away. The last thing I want is to hang with some wannabe heroes. He declared and disappeared in the building. Yuriraka, still hopeful, looked at his little sister, who gulped. I'm Eri. She squeaked before running back over to Zero, latching onto his waist. She's a little shy. He told the teenager while petting her hair. No playing around. Get your stuff off the bus. Once your bags are in the rooms, we'll have dinner in the cafeteria. After that, you can bathe and sleep. Tomorrow, your training starts in earnest. You better get a move on. Izuku smiled at Eri's enthusiasm as he braided her hair. She had spent the last of the day with a wild wild pussy cats and came to him excitedly about the stories they told the little girl. Her lips weren't smiling but her eyes sure were. Eri was healing. When I grow up, I want to be a hero. His hand stilled, smile dropping from his face. When he stopped braiding, she looked over her shoulder with an innocent look. Just like you are, she said and Izuku chuffed. Oh Iri. He said softly and finished off the braid, tying it with a rubber band. She turned around and sat on his crossed legs, making him clasp his hands behind her back for support. I'm no hero. Iri pouted. But you are a hero, and you help people. I want to help people too, Izuku. Izuku sighed, a mix of emotions crossing his face. Iri, 
I don't want you to go through the hardships I've faced. Heroes have their flaws, and the world can be a tough place. Iri looked down for a moment before meeting Izuku's gaze again. I know it's hard, but I want to make a difference. I want to be like you because you're kind, and you saved me. Izuku couldn't help but be moved by Iri's sincerity. He gently touched her cheek, a bittersweet smile on his face. Eri, if you want to be a hero, I'll support you every step of the way. Just promise me you'll always stay true to yourself and never lose that kindness. Eri nodded with determination. I promise, Izuku. I want to be a hero who helps people and brings smiles, just like you. She wrapped her arms around his neck, and Izuku hugged her back tight. Eri fell asleep. Still wrapped in Izuku's arms when Aizawa walked in a few minutes later with his hair tied back. He took one look at his protege's face and asked, What happened? She wants to be a hero. He whispered. I, I don't know how I feel about that. I'm not her keeper. I'm not overhaul. She's never been able to make a decision for herself. And now that she has, who am I to tell her no? Izuku sighed. She thinks I'm a hero. Can you believe it? Aizawa didn't answer. Morning class. Today, we will begin the train that will increase your strength. Our goal is to increase your skills exponentially, so that you can all get your provisional license. This will allow you to face the dangers that continue to lurk in the dark. Proceed carefully. Look alive, Bakugu. He tossed him a ball. Try throwing that for me. Yeah, sure. When you first started school, your record was 705 meters. Let's see if you've improved. Katsuki walked farther out into the open and stretched. Oh, I get it. We're checking our progress. Katsuki crouched, smirking. I've got this. He reeled his arm back. No one blink. Go to hell. He threw it. His explosions carried it far, and the air blew from the warm wind it created. Zero grimaced. Go to hell? That was 7096 meters. You've had a single semester at Yua, and due to your various experiences, all of you have definitely improved. But those improvements have mostly been limited to metal prowess and technical skill and a slight increase in stamina along the way. As you can see, your quirks themselves have not improved much on a fundamental level. That's why we're going to focus on strengthening your powers. Aizawa smirked. This'll be so hard you'll feel like you're dying. Let's hope you all survive. Two hours later, Class 1B walked out, still rubbing their eyes from sleep, while Wana looked like they've been training for three days straight. Last semester, Class A got all the attention, so next semester, it'll be Class B's turn. Got it? It won't be Class A, it'll be us, Class B. Zero looked down from the tree he was sitting in as 1B stopped below him. He rolled his eyes. Vlad King wanted to beat Class A. How was that going to happen if he didn't bother to wake them all up from their beauty sleep? Those of you who are operative types will have to raise your maximum limits. Heteromorphic types and other composite types need to train the parts of their body related to their quirks. Vlad explained and Aizawa walked up to them. Normally, this would occur as your bodies grow, but we don't have that time. Class B, you guys hurry up too. But once we join, there will be 40 in all. Can just six people manage the quirks of that many people? That's why they're here. That's right. The whole team of the pussycats jumped in. The four of us are one. Lock on with these sparkling gazes. We've come to lend a paw and help. Coming out of nowhere stingingly cute and cat-like. Wild, wild pussycats. The full version. I'm Ragdoll and my quirk is Search. I can know all the info about up to a hundred people by just looking at them. I can find out their location and weaknesses too. Pixie Bob jumped up to them. With my Earth Flow, I can make the perfect places for each person to train. And with my Telepath, I can give advice to multiple people at once, Mandalay said. And my job is through punching and kicking, said a man they called Tiger. Plus. There is one more instructor who will be joining us, Aizawa said ominously. Class B looked around. Who? Me. 
The students all jumped and Zero stepped off the tree branch, catching himself with it before dropping the rest of the way down. Is that a gun? You're Zero. Yep, and don't expect me to go easy on you either. You're here to be heroes. Then you have to earn it. He said with determination, and a shiver slithered down Class B's spine at the slightly savage look in his green eyes. Aizawa had decided to give mercy to the students and let them all get water and relax. After ten minutes or so, Zero came up front to join the teachers, dropping his duffel bag to the floor. Everyone was instantly on alert, especially when they saw the hint of a smirk in Zero's eyes. All right, everyone. Aizawa announced with his hands in his pockets. Training is not over yet. The only reason you're getting a break is because I had Zero do a little project for you all. He nodded at his teenage partner and Zero ripped the bag open, revealing stacks of notebooks. These notebooks are filled with an analysis of your quirks and fighting styles. The list all of your strengths and all of your weaknesses. You think you know the extent of your quirk? Well you don't. There is so much about your powers that you have yet to discover. Zero grabbed a pile and started towards them, passing them out one by one, listing their faults on the way. Then he got to the biggest one, Shoto Todoroki, youngest son of the number two hero Endeavor. He said with a hum, passing him his notebook. You're not using your fire. You can be the most powerful individual in this class, yet you are only using half of your strength. That's why Bakugo beat you in the sports festival. You're angry. He said everyone held their breaths as the boy glared at him. Zero shrugged. It's none of my business why, but you refuse because you think it's your father's quirk, yes? Todoroki's blink was the only shock he showed. Well, it's not. It's yours, your quirk, not his. Todoroki's breathing picked up and his eyes widened. You decide its limits. You decide how to use it. With that, he turns to last, but not least. Kak, he coughed. Katsuki Bakugo. The explosive boy snatched the book out of his hand. Your problem is your overconfidence. It's good to try hard, but you are trying a little too hard. Why? He looked into the familiar angry red eyes and watched sorrow flash for a split second before it disappeared. Are you doing this to become the best? Or are you doing it for someone else? Katsuki snarled, jumping up from the ground and grabbing his collar. Who do you think you are? You know nothing about me. I'm going to be the best without your shitty advice. He said. Zero reached up, gently but firmly grasping his wrists and pulling it off his coat. He patted down all of the invisible dust on his coat and sighed. Well, I'm sure that whoever you're doing this for your parents, a friend, they are very proud of you. He said a little too softly. Katsuki twitched in shock and his eyes glazed. Zero took a step back. All of your quirks' capabilities will be tested here. It's easy to forget that quirks are physical abilities too. One wrong move, you could kill someone or yourself. The vigilante walked away with his back turned. Don't worry though, he said, looking over his shoulder. That's what I'm here for. He exited the clearing, needing to check on Ure. Just as he entered the forest line, he faintly heard Kirishima say, that was such a manly exit. Zero was surprised that everyone was still standing after today's training, considering that half of them looked like they were already asleep. The pussycats were excitedly telling them that they were cooking their own meals from now on and Zero sympathized with them. Even after 12 straight hours of training, they were still being worked. When the students started to move, Zero turned to Aizawa. You're going to give them a break, right? Let them sleep in. His tired bloodshot eyes met his. This camp isn't supposed to be easy. They are here to train. So nodded. Yeah, but don't you think it'll be hard when they collapse from exhaustion? Plus, they could get seriously hurt. It's only six, and you guys are still planning to keep them out here. Even if it isn't for training, then you still have your remedial class. Aizawa held out a hand. Okay, I get it. I'll think about it. The teenager shifted until his back was to the students before reaching up and pulling the face mask off so that Aizawa could Izuku's sparkling grin. 
You're the best you know that? He said then, without caring about who could possibly be watching, Izuku hugged him. Aizawa's eyes bulged in shock. He looked around, but no one seemed to be watching them. The man smiled behind his capture weapon and laid a hand on Izuku's soft green curls. The moment between father and son was interrupted when a hand pulled on Izuku's pant leg. Izuku looked down to find his little sister there with big eyes. Izuku, where is Kota going? The team blinked, and both he and Aizawa looked in the direction where indeed the boy was walking into the forest and out of sight. Izuku hummed and broke away from Aizawa. I don't know. How about we go find out? He said and Iri nodded. Can we bring him food? She asked and Izuku smiled. That's a great idea. He pulled his mask back up and pulled her along to the huge pot filled with curry. Iri and Zero followed the small footsteps all the way up to a cliffside overlooking the entire forest. They found Kota sitting close to the ledge with his legs tucked against his chest. Zero smirked when he heard the boy's stomach growl. I heard that. He said as they walked up to him. Kota's head snapped up, eyes wide, and stumbled to his feet with a glare. How did you find me? He demanded and Zero shrugged. We just followed the trail of your footsteps. You didn't eat any food, so Eerie and I brought you some. Go away. This is my secret hideout. Zero blinked, looking around. This is a secret hideout. That's pretty cool kid. He said. Kota sneered and looked away when Zero offered him the bowl of curry, choosing to sit back down and just let his stomach continue to protest. Zero sighed, sitting with him, Eri coming around to Kota's other side. Your parents were the water hose duo, right? He asked bluntly and Kota gasped, spinning to him. Did Mandalay tell you? He demanded and Zero held his hands up. She told me what happened, not who they were. I remember them. Saw them on the news. I remembered thinking that if I was there, then I could have saved them, but they were too far away. The boy sneered at him. So you are a hero. Did you just want to take him down so you could get all the glory? He snapped and Zero shook his no. No, I'm no hero. I'm what people call a vigilante. Someone who helps civilians illegally. Kota looked away. It's the same thing. He grumbled and Izuku smiled bitterly. They sat in silence before Zero told him his story. You know, I don't like heroes either. Zero confessed and Kota stiffened. There was a time when I wanted to be a hero more than anything with my best friend. But then my quirk appeared and he wanted nothing to do with me anymore. That's when I became a vigilante. I was doing it for a couple of years before, he hesitated. Before a hero killed my mother. He whispered. Both of the children's eyes widened. That's right, he never told Eri about this either. It was an accident, I suppose. But back then, I didn't see it that way. She got caught up in a villain attack, looking for me when I ran away. The villain had used her as a human shield, so that the hero, Zepter's blades went through her instead. I hunted him down. I wanted to kill him, and I almost succeeded, but then Eraserhead stopped me. He's the hobo-looking man that is teacher class 1A. Zero smiled, looking at the stars. I'm glad he did though, because then I wouldn't be any better than he was. I've accepted that it was an accident, but that resentment never left. He looked at Koda's pale face. You and I have more in common than you think. With that, Zero stood, stretching. All right, I'm gonna head back. He looked at his sister. Are you coming with me? You can stay if Kota wants. They both looked at the boy, who blushed and nodded. She can stay. Zero smirked. Someone was developing a little crush. How cute. He left the bowl of curry on the ground. I'll leave that here for you then. Be safe you guys. He started his trek back down the mountain. Aizawa had taken his advice and let his class sleep in, making them look more energetic, but would probably feel the same exhaustion as the night before. Maybe the teachers would let them have another night in the hot springs. Todoroki. Zero called, walking towards them. Come with me. He demanded, continuing past him. Todoroki followed him suspiciously until he led him to a metal barrel. 
Get in, Sa said, pointing at the barrel. He furrowed his brows but listened. Now use your ice and take it as far as it can go around you. Then use your fire to melt it. Zero held up a hand when he started to protest. I don't care about the vow you made to defy your father. You're here to extend your quirk's abilities. So remember what I said and use your fire. Zero walked away, looking for anyone else to help. He looked over to Katsuki and watched him sink his arms into boiling water, then pointed them above him to let out an explosion as he did against Uraraka in the sports festival with a yell. He's been doing that for hours. His arms have to be on fire with how much he's going past his limits. But he never stopped. Zero admired that kind of dedication. He was so determined to become number one. To become the best. There were no words to describe how much Izuku misses him. He was going to tell him, someday. But now wasn't the time. He walked towards Aoyama and Yuraraka, who looked just seconds away from puking, and continued his job as an instructor. After the classes made their own dinner again, the pussy cats announced the first fun activity of the summer training camp. Eri had disappeared, and since Kota wasn't in sight either, then they must have gone to Kota's cliff. He was happy that she made a friend, but was also sad to know that they wouldn't see each other often after they left the camp. Now, we've filled our bellies and washed the dishes, and now, it's time for a totally awesome test of courage. Ashido was almost bursting at the seams with excitement. Not so fast. Aizawa yawned. It pains me to say this, but the remedial class will be having class with me instead. You're kidding me. Sorry. He didn't sound sorry, though as he wrapped his capture weapon around the five of them. Your training today didn't impress me, so I have to use this time. Give me a break, let us be tested. Aizawa ignored them as he dragged them back into the building. Zero snickered. Poor guys. Eden noticed Zero finally alone and approached him with a sense of gratitude weighing on his shoulders. With a deep breath, he gathered his thoughts and walked up to the mysterious vigilante. Excuse me, Ida began, a mix of determination and appreciation in his voice. I wanted to thank you for saving my brother Tensei. Your intervention meant a lot to him and to our family. Zero, still in his distinct costume, turned to face Ida. The masked visage gave away nothing, but there was a subtle acknowledgement in his posture. I don't know who you are behind that mask, Ida continued, but you've earned my gratitude. Tensei told me about the person who came to his rescue, and I felt it was only right to express my thanks directly. The air held a moment of quiet acknowledgement between them, the weight of gratitude and unspoken words lingering beneath the surface. Zero remained silent for a moment the mask concealing any visible expression. Then, in a low, modulated voice, he replied, Saving lives is what I do. Your brother was in danger, and I couldn't stand by. No thanks needed. Zero turned his back to him, watching the group of students try and fail to make food. I hope you continue your vigilant efforts, Ida added, a sense of respect evident in his tone. He bowed. You have our appreciation, Zero. With a respectful nod, Ida walked back. Okay, so Class B will be the first to be the scarers. Class A will leave in pairs every three minutes. There are tags with your names written on them in the middle of the route, so bring those back with you. Those being the scarers aren't allowed to make direct contact. Show us how scary you are with your quirks. The class that makes the most people piss their pants with creativity and imagination wins. Ragdoll explained with that ever-present goofy smile. As soon as teams were made and students walked through the forest, it didn't take long for the screams to start. You didn't want to join them? Mandalay asked when she came up next to him leaning up against the tree. Nah, it would have been an odd number, and I'm not a student. But you're still a teenager, aren't you? I can tell by your height and voice. You should be having fun, don't you think? She said and Zero's eyebrows furrowed. Nostrils flaring. Is that smoke? He sniffed again and walked away from the prow, ignoring her questions and looking over the tree line, where smoke was indeed growing. Todoroki and Kakin wouldn't be that stupid to start a fire. 
even if they did get scared. His eyes widened. Someone's here, he spun around. Mandalay. Pixie Bob started to float in the air, a blue aura surrounding her, before she was pulled back into the bushes with a yelp. Zero followed her and grasped Blackout when he found her sprawled on the ground, unconscious with blood leaking from her head. A woman stood over her with a beam of concrete. Tiger burst in next to him. Pixie Bob. The woman chuckled and Zero went white, his sniper lowering. Kodiri. He trusted Tiger to handle her and ran towards Koda's hideout. Koda whimpered, backing up with Eerie behind him when the hulking figure in front of him stepped forward. Mandalay's voice filtered into his head. Koda Koda, can you hear my telepath? Hurry up and come back to camp. I'm sorry, I don't know where you usually go off to. I'm sorry Koda, I can't go save you. Come back as soon as you can. I tried searching somewhere with a nice view, and I ended up finding a face not on our list. Hey, by the way, you've got a nice hat there, kid. The hooded figure pointed at the white mask covering his face. Trade with me for this lame mask. They made me wear this toy since I'm new, saying they couldn't get the shipment in time or something. Koda screamed and pulled Eri down the mountain. Oh well. The guy threw the mask away and jumped in front of the two of them before they could get too far. I think you and I should have some fun up here, kids. Ready? Tendrils of muscle snaked from inside his arm, encasing it. He pulled it back and lunged, making Eri scream. His black hood fell and Koda felt the breath leave his lungs. He recognized that grinning face. He saw him on TV after his parents were killed. Water hose. They were wonderful heroes. But the couple's bright lives were cut short by a single cruel criminal. The suspect is still on the run, and police and heroes are on his trail. You. The suspect's quirk is a simple power-up type, and he is very dangerous. If you see this face, contact the police or a hero immediately. In addition, the suspect goes by the name Muscular and is thought to have sustained an injury on his left eye from his fight with Water Hose earlier. It was him. He was the one that killed them. Papa Mama, he whimpered. The villain almost reached them before a gunshot rang and he suddenly started to convulse. The man collapsed to the ground and Zero stood behind him, cocking his reloaded gun and running up to the six-year-olds. Are you guys okay? He asked looking them over for any injuries. Both of them were crying but otherwise looked unharmed. He sighed with relief that he got here in time and turned to the villain again. I'm going to distract him. You guys need to get out of here and back to camp. He said, widening his stance when the man started to stand again. Don't worry guys, I won't let him touch you. Oh my, I wonder why that is. You'll protect them. That sounds just like a wannabe hero would say. Your kind shows up everywhere, talking about justice. You're the one called Zero, right? This is perfect. We were told to take the initiative and kill you. More muscle crawled up his arm. I'll make sure to torment you thoroughly, so show me your blood. He lunged and Zero raised his gun, firing the bullet before Muscular could do anything about it. The bullet tore through the grown muscle on his side and into his real skin. He yelled when blood squirted out. Zero had never used any of his real bullets ever, but desperate times called for desperate measures. It was actually luck that it was just a flesh wound when he was moving so fast. You're not coming anywhere near them while I'm here. He reached back and loaded an explosive bullet. More muscle grew from his side, covering the bullet wound and stopping the bleeding. Muscular growled. Oh yeah, hey, maybe you can help me out a little bit first. Do you know where a kid named Bakugu might be around here? Zero stiffened. Kakin. I still have to do my job. He attacked again and Zero fired the bullet at his feet. The ground exploded, sending the man back into the mountainside. He reloaded the gun with another real bullet and ushered the two kids in front of him. Run. They listened, with Zero behind him. They were his first priority. The mountain shook and Zero gasped. He quickly pushed Iri and Koda to the side and turned to face the man again. 
but he couldn't raise Black out in time and Muscular's fist smashed into his arm, sending him into the mountain next to the kids. Zero screamed, his arm tearing and breaking. Izu Zero, Eri screamed and kneeled next to him, a river of tears flowing from her eyes. Blackout smacked against the ground next to him. Zero sucked in a breath and moved his functioning hand to his damaged arm, wincing when it glowed red. Remember water hose? Kota said, trying to distract Muscular from advancing. My mom and my dad. Did you torment them like that too, before you killed them? Zero's eyes widened. Muscular scrunched his eyebrows, spitting out blood. Huh? Seriously? Those losers were your parents? Well then, this must be fate. It's thanks to them that my left eye is artificial now. This is all your fault. Nothing in the world is right anymore, and it's because of crazy guys like you, he screamed. Muscular just sighed. Kids are always so quick to say it's someone else's fault. Don't get the wrong idea. It's not like I took them out just because I was mad about the eye thing. I just wanted to kill people, and those two wanted to stop me. It was the result of all of us doing what we wanted. What's wrong is wanting to do something you are unable to do. That's why your dear old mommy and daddy died. He summoned more muscle and Zero's arm barely turned yellow before he let his power go and lunged at the villain, leaving Blackout behind. You ruined his life, and you won't take the blame? His injured arm thrust forward and got trapped in the muscle of his shoulder. Got you now. Doesn't matter how quick you are. And then what? You gonna punch me with that weak arm of yours? No. He unsheathed the nine black knife on his thigh. I'm going to do this. He attacked and sank the knife into Muscular's other eye. His scream echoed across the whole mountain, and the flesh released Zero's arm. The vigilante stumbled back and fell to his knees, dropping the knife. Izuku. Iri whimpered and wrapped her arms around his side. He breathed heavily. What are you guys still doing here? He panted. You need to get back to camp. Iri was already shaking her head. I'm not leaving you. She cried and Zero unbuckled his fifteen knife and gave it to Koda. Take Iri and get out of here. I'm not going to say it again. I can't fight him if I know you guys aren't safe. Don't tell me you're attacking him again. It won't work. Let's run. You already managed to injure him. Zero shook his head. He wanted so badly to heal his arm completely, but that would deplete his energy, and he needed as much as he could have. He blinked. Of course. Zero reached into his front pouch and pulled out his new bullet. He tugged his black shirt up and stabbed the small needle into his sternum. Zer grunted from the sharp pain, but his entire body started to glow, and to his shock, he could feel some of his energy returning to him. They watched the torn skin and muscle on his arm stitch itself back together and sighed with relief. Zero stood with his newfound energy. Now go, he pushed them both gently. Go find a racer head and get back to camp. I'll be just fine. Just then, Muscular started to groan and stand now completely blind with blood streaked down from his closed eye. Kota grabbed Eri's hand with a sniffle, and they ran down the mountain, Zero watched them, until they were no longer in sight. He grabbed his trusty weapon and faced Muscular once again, who ran for him blindly. Zero raised his gun. Bang. I'll look after the other students. Protect them. Aizawa told Vlad and the whole building shook, while Aizawa ran out of the classroom. If it's a full-scale attack, he slammed the door open, taking in the black smoke and forest fire. We're in big trouble. Looks like your concern has you distracted, Eraser. The pro-hero's head snapped to the side as a heavily scarred man in dark clothes and black hair swung a blue-flamed hand in his direction. Vlad! Dabai unleashed his flames upon him. The blue flames disappeared and Dabai smirked at the empty space in front of him. Looking at the side of the building where Eraser had hung by his scarf, Quirk activated. Nice move. Dabai attacked again and blinked when his flames didn't flicker into existence. Not so fast. Another part of Eraserhead's capture weapon snapped out and latched onto the villain. Dabai grunted as he was pulled into the air and Aizawa grabbed his head, 
and kneed him under the chin before spinning him around and holding him to the ground. He took hold of his arm. What do you want and where are your friends hiding? Dabai snarled. My what? Aizawa's eyes narrowed. Your right arm is next. He pulled and something snapped. Be logical about this. At least save your legs. It would be a real pain to have to carry you off to jail without them. You can take your time, Eraserhead. The teacher was fast to activate his quirk again when he saw a flicker of the blue flames on his head. He looked up when the fire in the distance seemed to rumble and a gunshot echoed through the canyon. The hero's breath hitched. Midoriya. Mr. Aizawa. He looked at his four students coming through the forest. As relieved as he was to see them unharmed, he glared at them. Stay back. Dabai booked him off and stood. He looked over his shoulder. That's exactly the performance I would expect from a teacher at Yua. Tell me, hero. Aizawa pulled on his scarf to keep him captured, but his eyes widened when it snapped through his body. You worried for your students? Aizawa gasped. The fire that he shot earlier wasn't his quirk? Dabai grinned at him. I wonder if you can save them in the end. See you soon. Mud slapped to the ground and replacement. Ida and the others ran up to him. What was that? Did he just melt? Mainta yelled and Aizawa sprinted past them. Get inside, I'll be back. He ran into the forest. Honestly, he didn't really know where he was going, but he needed to find any of the children. Mr. Aizawa. He slid to a halt when Iri and Koder ran up to him. He let out a sigh when they were uninjured. Are you both okay? Iri and Koda cried. You have to help him. He's fighting him alone. Koda cried, and it was just then that Aizawa noticed the familiar black knife held tightly in his grasp. His heart stalled, and he pointed behind him. Follow my footsteps back to the camp. Do not stop until you get inside. I'll go get him, don't worry. The two children nodded and ran. Aizawa raced up the mountain they had come from. Zero was on his knees, breath coming in short pants, as he stared at Muscular's unmoving form, blood a steady stream from the hole in his forehead. It was like a mantra in his head. I killed him. I killed him. I killed him. He's dead. I shot him. The gravel crunched behind him, but he was frozen. He actually killed someone. There was blood on his hands. A hand grabbed his shoulder and turned him away from the body. Zero's ears were ringing, both from the shock and the ear-splitting gunshot that he fired. A calloused hand tilted his chin up, dragging his mask down his face and Izuku met Aizawa's eyes. His lips were moving, but he couldn't hear a word. Aizawa cupped his face, eyes scanning his body for injuries, but they were already healed. A-U-O-Y. I killed him. Aizawa stiffened. Oh, did he say that out loud? The man looked at the prone villain before back at Izuku helping him up, grabbing Blackout, and leading him away from the body. It'll okay. When they were down the mountain, his partner kneeled down in front of him, and his hearing started to return as Aizawa shook him. Are okay? Midoriya, are you okay? Izuku was nodding before his brain could catch up. He shivered, making the pro rub his arms. Good. That's good. Come on. Let's get you back to camp. He stood and pulled on his wrist. Izuku blinked and didn't move. No, they're after Kaken. I have to find him. I have to help. Midoriya, you're shaking. You just... He couldn't finish. You're not in the right state of mind. He said instead and started to pull him again. I'll be fine. Please let me help. I have to help him. Please. He begged and for the first time since he met him on the rooftop three years ago, Izuku looked like a vulnerable kid instead of the fearsome vigilante. Another boom shook the forest, jolting Aizawa back to reality. He sighed and gave him blackout. Fine, okay. I'll keep searching for the students. Go back to camp and give Mandalay a message for me. Mandalay grunted as she was knocked back to the ground. Spinner laughed above her, raising the collection of swords above his head to deal the final blow. Bang. Spinner convulsed, dropping the strapped weapons and twitching uselessly on the ground. She spun around as Zero ran out of the bushes. 
Mandalay, Coda is safe. Her eyes shudder with relief. You found him? I've also got a message from Mr. Azawa. I need you to use telepath. Tell everyone in class A and B that Eraserhead has granted them permission to engage in combat with the villains. She nodded once. Everyone in class A and class B. In the name of the pro hero Eraserhead, you are granted permission to engage in combat with the villains. I repeat, use your training. You can fight these villains. You need to send one more thing. The villains, I know why they're here. They're after Kakan. Please, you have to let the others know. He was so panicked about getting to his friend that he didn't realize that he called him by his chosen nickname. Kakan? Who's that? Izuku didn't answer. He ran straight for Magni, who kicked Tiger off of her and used her magnet quirk to make him fly towards her. Zero's eyes narrowed. Fine then. He slung Blackout over his shoulder and elongated his bow staff, positioning himself feet first so that he slammed them into her chest, knocking her to the ground. The quirk wore off and Izuku smacked his staff into her forehead, knocking her unconscious. He took off, disappearing into the forest. Mandalay gulped, but activated her quirk again. Listen, we've discovered one of the villain's targets. It's a student named Kaken. Kaken, you should try to avoid combat and stick to a group. I hope you can hear me. Katsuki's explosions fizzled out when he heard the message. Kaken. He hasn't heard that name in four years. Had never expected to hear it again. Only one person called him that, and he was dead. Kaken? Who is that? Class 1B? Todoroki said behind him. Katsuki stared at the villain who was recovering from Todoroki's last ice attack. Me, Katsuki whispered and Todoroki's eyes spun to him. But that's impossible. No one knows about that name. He said in a daze. His classmate gasped and stomped his foot on the ground, summoning more ice to block the villain's blades of teeth. Katsuki shook out of his daze and spun around to their opponent, hands popping. Todoroki glared at him. We can't start fires around here because the flames will spread. Everyone could die if we aren't careful. Do you understand me? God, he's never been so annoyed with someone in his entire life. Katsuki snarled but lowered his hand. Yeah, I get it. I'm not stupid. Todoroki looked deeper into the forest. Even if we retreat, there's poison gas everywhere. They're obviously trying to drive us into a corner. He huffed in agitation. What do we do Tataroki couldn't do much? Not with a student from Class B unconscious on his back. What would he do? Zero panted as he ran through the forest, his senses heightened, alert for any sign of danger. The darkness enveloped him like a cloak, but he navigated through the shadows with ease, his steps silent against the underbrush. Suddenly, a rustling sound disrupted the quiet of the night. Zero froze, instinctively reaching for his weapon. He tensed, ready for a confrontation. But to his surprise, the figure that emerged from the darkness was not an enemy, but rather Shoji from Class 1A. Shoji? What are you doing out here? Oh questioned, his voice low, still on edge from the earlier attack. Shoji's expression was grave as he approached, his multiple arms shifting anxiously. The vigilante's eyes landed on the severed one, dripping steadily of blood. Takoyami's dark shadow went out of control. We were ambushed by villains and Takoyami covered us. But the attack triggered his quirk, even if he was desperately trying to hold it back. Takoyami's quirk offensive ability obviously gets stronger when he's in the darkness. Very powerful, but very dangerous. He landed third place in the sports festival. Even in sunlight, he's powerful. He has great restraint and control. Takoyami is easily one of the strongest individuals in Class 1A. But without that control, it makes Dark Shadow aggressive and hard to control. A roar shattered the night. Zero narrowed his eyes. How did he get this way? After Mandalay told us that we shouldn't engage, we were on high alert. But the villain still got the drop on us. I hid in the bushes and tried to cover Takoyami, but one of my arms was cut off. It looks bad, but it's not like it's gone forever. 
My dupla arms are capable of making duplicates. One of those was cut off. The thing is, he couldn't stand seeing me injured. The quirk he had been suppressing took over. The darker it is, the less control Takoyami has. I had no idea his quirk could explode like this. It started lunging at any sound it heard with indiscriminate attacks. Zero lifted a hand to his chin and hummed. Dark shadow can only be stopped when he's exposed to light. Kakin figured that out, and used it against him he nodded. That's it. He turned back to Shoji. How long can you expand your arms? Shoji blinked. Around 30 feet I think. He responded making Zir nod again. Good. That's plenty of room. If Dark Shadow reacts to sound, then make duplicate arms to bait him so he'll follow you without attacking your body, yeah? Then try to find Bakugo and Todoroki so they can use their quirks on him. He bit his lip. Make sure you keep an eye on Bakugo. He's the one the villains are after. A villain let it slip that he was the one he was their target. Kakin would be fine. He didn't need to be there. Not if he was surrounded by his classmates. I should focus on finding others. But Zero disappeared before he could finish. Shoji sighed, before quietly moving further from the berserk quirk. Once he was in position, he took a deep breath and snapped his dupla arms out making as much noise as he could. Dark shadow roared again and Shoji was running when he heard the trees crashing to the ground and the ground beneath his feet shaking. He didn't know how long he was running until he saw his designated classmates. Their attention snapped away from the villain they were facing. Bakugo, Tadaroki, we need light, Shoji yelled, running towards them. Tadaroki put the student on his back on the ground and started to light his left side but Katsuki held out a hand. No stop. Dark Shadow spotted the villain and ruthlessly attacked, smashing him into the ground instantly. Only then did Todoroki and Katsuki use their quirks to calm Dark Shadow, and Takoyami fell to the ground panting heavily. One problem down many more to go. In the heart of the dense forest, Zero moved with swift agility, leaping from one tree branch to another to find his friend. The moonlight filtered through the leaves, casting a dim glow on the treetops as Zero navigated the shadows, his movements calculated and silent. The forest seemed to come alive with each powerful leap, the air humming with a sense of anticipation. Zero's sharp eyes scanned the surroundings, searching for any sign of Katsuki Bakugo. The leaves rustled, and the branches creaked beneath Zero's weight as he moved seamlessly through the treetops. As he jumped from tree to tree, Zero's senses heightened, picking up on faint sounds and subtle disturbances in the air. The forest canopy provided both cover and vantage points, allowing Zero to maintain the element of surprise in their pursuit. A sequel of delight reached Zero's ears. Yay, that means I'm your friend too, so landed silently in the tree across them. A blonde with messy buns leaned in close to Asui who was hanging from a tree trunk by her dark green hair. While the crazy girl was caught up in whatever fucked up fantasy she was living in, Zero noticed Yuraka crumpled on the ground, a short distance away from them, limbs straining to stand back up. Hawa, you're bleeding too. You look even more adorable. I just love blood. We're gonna be such good friends. She leaned in close to the frog girl, licking her lips. Zero chose that moment to intervene. Well well, if it isn't the poster child for bad decisions. Did you get lost on your way to the villain's anonymous support group? Or are you just naturally drawn to places where justice thrives? Zuh quipped, their voice laced with a mixture of sarcasm and confidence. All three of the girls spun to his voice and Zero hopped down from the tree, dusting off his gloved hands. Himiko Toga's eyes gleamed with a dangerous excitement unfazed by the snide remarks. A new playmate, huh? You've got that mysterious hero vibe. I like it. But seriously, what's with the whole Zero thing? Trying too hard to be edgy. Zero's masked expression remained stoic, unaffected by Toga's taunts. Call it what you want. Edgy, mysterious, or just someone who prefers not to broadcast their life story to every villain with a listening device. Now, let's focus on the matter at hand. Toga, undeterred, twirled a knife between her fingers. 
Oh, we're getting serious, are we? Fine, fine. But I hope you're ready for a playdate with a twist. I've got a knack for turning things a bit bloody. Zero's gaze sharpened, the moonlight glinting off their visor. Bloodshed is not a game. It's a consequence, and I intend to prevent it tonight. Your twisted version of playtime ends now. He takes his bow staff, letting it snap out in his hand. He twirled it in his hands and moved in front of Uraraka. Zil lunged forward, the encounter escalating into a fast-paced dance of skill and strategy. Toga, true to her chaotic nature, reveled in the unpredictability of the confrontation. The moonlit clearing became a stage for their clash, each move a carefully calculated step or a whimsical leap into the unknown. As the battle unfolded, Toga's dangerous excitement clashed with Zero's composed determination, creating a dynamic that echoed through the darkened forest. The air crackled with tension, and the clash between vigilante and villain played out like a twisted symphony, each note a testament to the unpredictable nature of their encounter. The clash between Zero and Himiko Toga intensified, each move calculated with precision and countered with strategic finesse. Toga, with her unpredictability, aimed to exploit any opening, but Zero remained one step ahead, their movements a blend of skill and efficiency. As the battle reached its climax, Zero anticipated Toga's next move and swiftly disarmed her, rendering her weapons useless. Toga, undeterred, unleashed a flurry of acrobatic attacks, but Zero deftly dodged and countered with a series of calculated strikes. You're persistent, I'll give you that, Zero remarked, their voice steady amidst the chaos. Toga, breathing heavily, but still grinning, retorted. Persistence is my middle name, Zero. Well, not literally, but you get the point. In a decisive moment, Zero executed a well-timed maneuver, disorienting Toga and leaving her vulnerable. With precision, Zero incapacitated her without causing serious harm. Toga, realizing the tables had turned, let out a frustrated growl. You're no fun, Zero. Maybe I'll save the grand finale for another day, Toga said with a manic glint in her eyes as she hastily retreated into the shadows, disappearing into the night. Zero watched her escape, ready but not eager for a pursuit. The moonlit forest settled into an eerie calm as Zero assessed the aftermath of the skirmish. The battle may have ended for now, but the enigmatic vigilante knew that in the world of heroes and villains, the next encounter was always on the horizon. When it was obvious that Togo wasn't coming back, Zero pressed the button on his staff, and it shrunk back into place. He turned to Uraraka, who was pulling the needle from Asui's hair that was keeping her pinned to the tree. The two girls turned to him with those familiar eyes of gratitude. Are you girls okay? Did she hurt you? They shook their heads. No, we're good. Zer nodded. Good. Then we need to find Kak. He cleared his throat. Bakugo. Asui and Yuraraka glanced at each other. Shouldn't we be looking for Kaken? Bakugo is pretty strong, even by himself. His eyes widened. Oh shit. I must have called him that when I told Mandalay to send the message. Osad. Kaken is Bakugo. He winced. The girls gaped. Wait. How do you know? Because it was what I called him when we were kids. Asui put her finger against her chin. So then, you guys were childhood friends. Does he know who you are, Ribbit? Zero shook his head, holding out his hands. No, no he doesn't, and I would very much like to keep it that way so please, you can't tell him that I'm alive. He froze. Then both the girls froze. He thinks you're dead? Uraraka screeched, and the boy shushed her. Yes, now can we please? Uraraka, Asui. Todoroki and Shoji walked out of the forest and up to them. Oh good, you guys are okay. So said, taking Black out from his back and loading it with his paralysis bullets. I'm glad Shoji and Takoyami found you. Zero paused, looking over their shoulders and raising an eyebrow. Speaking of... Where are Bakugo and Takoyami? The two boys spun around before their faces went pale. Nice trick, eh? Their heads snapped up to the tree above them. A man with a long yellow coat, top hat, 
and a white and black mask. I took the lads you're talking about with my magic. He played with the shiny blue marbles in his gloved hand. A talent like his would be squandered were he to be cast as a hero. We shall provide him with a grander stage where he can truly shine. Zero snarled. Give them back. Give them back. What an odd thing to say. They don't belong to anyone. They're their own person. Don't be so arrogant. We'll stop you. Right now. Todoroki stepped onto the ground, letting ice pillars shoot toward him. But the villain jumped away. Why the aggression? We merely wish to show him that there are options besides the fanatic world of heroism he's drowning in. Better to choose a path that aligns with your values after all. He snatched two of our strongest classmates without a sound. What power is this? Todoroki glared at the villain. If you're monologuing because you think you've beaten us, you're mistaken. He twirled the marble between his fingers. A bad habit. I used to be an entertainer, you know. Taking Takoyami was a bit of improv on my part. When I saw him destroying everything in sight, I decided he should join our troop. You can't take them. Zero screamed and lifted Blackout, firing the loaded bullet. The man was glowing before he ever fired and was suddenly gone, making the bullet hit the tree behind him. A blue marble rolled off the branch and hit the ground softly before the man appeared from it. Todoroki shoved the boy on his back into Yuroraka's arms and ran to join him. He stomped on the ground and made a huge ice barrier like he did at the sports festival, if not bigger. But the villain jumped away. Apologies. But slight at hand and escapology are my specialties, not combat. He disappeared behind an ice spike and appeared with his hand in his pocket before pulling it out and clasping it behind his head. I'm not foolish enough to fight hero students from Yua. Vanguard Action Squad, I've acquired the target. The main show has officially come to a close. Meet me at the retrieval point in the next five minutes for the final bow. They're going to take them, our friends. Zero didn't acknowledge them. He just started running after him, vaguely hearing the others following him. Zero slid to a stop kneeling and setting blackout on the ground. Uraraka, you have to make us float, and then Asui, you throw us as hard as you can with your tongue. Shoji, hold me and Todoroki, and use your quirk to correct our trajectory in the air. Measure the distance with your eyes, Uraraka, and when the timing looks right, release us. Zero, Shoji, and Todoroki all went back to back letting Asui wrap her tongue around the three of them and Yuraraka activated her quirk, making the three of them float. All right, Sue. Yuraraka backed off and Asui tossed them into the air in hot pursuit after the yellow coat villain. When they got above him, they felt the weightlessness of Yuraraka's quirk disappear and they all kicked the villain to the ground. He let out a startled scream and the three teenagers slammed him into the ground, making a crater from the impact. Give Bakugo and Takoyami back to us, Zero commanded. Dabai's hand started burning with blue fire. Out of the way, compress. The villain underneath them glowed, and a blue marble replaced him. Dabai attacked them, and the three got out of the way before the fire reached them directly. But Zero and Shoji yelled when the fire just barely licked their skin, and their arms were burning. Zero, Shoji. Todoroki attacked with his ice when twice jumped towards him. So dodged the silver capsule when it shot towards his face. Togo jumped into the air and knocked the vigilante onto her back. I've been thinking since I fought you, Zero. She slid a knife out of her sheath, making Zero gasp. That you'd be so much cuter if you just bled a little. Togo brought the knife down. Zero, Shoji's duplirms swiped in front of him and knocked the girl off of him. Togo yelped and slid across the ground. She was silent for a few moments before she glanced up, rage swimming through her golden eyes. So that's how it is. You want to be between us? She squeezed the knife hilt harder, and Izuku stood extending his bow staff again. Now would really be a good time for the knife he gave to Koda. Give me all you got. Twice yelled in a gruff voice and cut through the ice with the flexible weapon in his hand. Landed on the flat of it, and his voice got higher. Hey man, cut me some slack. 
The sudden change in attitude sent Todoroki reeling. What the hell is with this guy? In the crater, Compress grew from the marble. Ugh. I can't believe you wrecked my exit. Unrehearsed amateurs. He grumbled, walking to Dabai. Did you get Bakugo? Dabai asked and Compress reached into his pocket. Of course I did. But he stilled when he felt nothing there. Zero Todoroki. We're done. He gave away his best trick. I'm not sure what your quirk is, but it has to do with those little marbles, right? Shoji stood and lifted his hand, two marbles held inside. So I'm guessing these are Takoyami and Bakugo. You rescued them. Oh ho ho, Compress laughed. Will color me impressed. Just what I'd expect from someone with so many hands. The teenagers ignored them and ran away. Todoroki created an ice barrier to block them. Right, nice job, Shoji. Dabai growled, holding out a hand. Moran. No. Compressed stopped him. Zero gasped when a mutated creature slipped from the forest. Anamu. They changed directions and a black and purple mass appeared in front of them. This guy. He was at the Yasuji. It's been five minutes since the signal. Let's go, Dabai. Kirajiri said. Toga and Twice disappeared through the mini gates next to them. Compress started walking too. Hold on. We're not leaving without the kid. Don't worry. They were so proud of themselves, rooting through my pockets, that I thought I'd let them gloat. Compress said smugly. His smug statement caught their attention. Compress turned back to them. But allow me to explain the basic rules of magic. He reached up removed his top, and grabbed his mask. If I'm flaunting something shiny, it means there's something else I don't want you to see. He slipped the mask to the side and opened his smirking face, revealing two blue marbles on his tongue. This time, they could see Katsuki's and Takoyami's bodies trapped inside. They gasped. He's got them! Compress snapped his fingers, and the marbles in Shoji's hand exploded. Is that my ice? That's right. During the freezing attack, I prepared dummies and slipped them into my right pocket. Zero snarled, running back towards them, Shoji and Todoroki close behind. Damn it! His voice cracked from desperation. Compress slipped his mask and hat back on, sinking into the warp gate. A little bit of misdirection. I do so adore a twist ending. One last bow, and then the curtain faw. A familiar sparkling beam of light shot out from the bushes and hit Compress's mouth. The villain choked and the marbles fell from his mouth. Zero glanced to the side and noticed Aoyama cowering behind the bushes. He'd have to thank him later. Shoji reached out and grabbed one of the marbles, while Todoroki reached for the other. He was almost there. So close he closed his wrist around the marble and Dabai's hand snatched it before him. Todoroki went white. Well, isn't that a shame? Poor little Shoto Todoroki. The dual-haired colored teenager skidded to the ground. Confirm it now. Release them. Dabai commanded and Compress sank back into the warp gate. That laser ruined my finale. He snapped his fingers and Takoyami came flying out of Shoji's grasp and Katsuki and Dabai's, who grabbed him by the neck. Dabai smirked. Checkmate. Kagan no. The blonde boy's eyes widened at the name. He stared at him, at the shining emerald eyes that haunted his mind every day. Zero reached out a hand, the sleeve of his shirt riding up and revealing the orange and black twin bracelet to him. Katsuki choked, not from Dabai's hold on his throat, but from the revelation that his best friend was actually alive. Deku? He whispered and sunk into the warp gate, disappearing from their view. Zero collapsed on the other side from where the warp gate once stood. Deku? He failed. Izuku failed. Ah. He was too late. The warehouse felt colder than usual as Izuku Midoriya returned, his steps heavy with a weight of guilt and concern. Closing the door behind him, Izuku took a deep breath, trying to steady his racing thoughts. The dim light from the Christmas lights overhead cast shadows that seemed to mirror the turmoil within him. His gaze fell on the sparse surroundings, 
the warehouse a stark reflection of the challenges he faced. Izuku walked to his bed and gently set Eri's sleeping form on the pillows and stepped farther into the space to keep her from waking. The low hum of electricity echoed as Izuku meticulously checked his equipment. His costume, a symbol of his commitment to vigilantism, hung ready for action. The familiar weight of his cowl reassured him, concealing the emotions that churned beneath the surface. The events leading to Katsuki's kidnapping replayed in Izuku's mind, fueling the fire of determination within him. He couldn't stand by and allow his friend to suffer at the hands of villains. The gravity of the situation hung thick in the air, but Izuku's resolve remained unbroken. A makeshift map, hastily drawn, lay spread across a table, marked with potential locations and known villain hideouts. Izuku studied it intently, planning his route and anticipating the challenges that awaited him. His mind raced with strategies, each step a calculated move toward rescuing Katsuki. The silence of the warehouse was shattered as Izuku clenched his fists, determination etched across his features. I won't let them hurt you, Kaken. I'll bring you back, no matter what it takes. He reached for his mask, securing it in place, the mask of the vigilante known as Zero. The alias that allowed him to operate outside the constraints of official heroism, to move in the shadows where he deemed necessary. He glanced at the little girl oblivious to the crisis surrounding Izuku. He was nervous about leaving her here alone, but she knew her way around here and there was plenty of food and water if she got hungry. He sighed. He needed to do this. So he took out paper and wrote her a note to let her know where he was and left a spare knife next to it in case anything happened. As he stepped out into the night, the warehouse door creaking shut behind him, Izuku Midoriya, now zero embarked on a solitary mission. The city's skyline loomed overhead, a silent witness to the undying bond of friendship that drove him forward into the heart of danger to rescue the one who had always been by his side. Perched on the edge of a towering building, Zero gazed out over the city, a silent vigilante catching a rare moment of respite. The night had stretched on for two relentless days of searching for Katsuki Bakugo leaving Zero both physically and emotionally drained. The echoes of the city below seemed distant as Zero sought solace in the quiet of the rooftop. The chill of the night air cut through Zero's costume, a reminder of the urgent mission at hand. He sighed, a heavy breath escaping the confines of their mask, and ran a gloved hand through his green hair. He watched the civilians walk through the lightened streets of Musutafu, all going on with their daily routines. Let's return to a short clip from the Yua High School press conference that just wrapped up. Zero's head snapped to the jumbo screen in the streets, his eyes widening at Aizawa, Vlad King, and Principal Nezu on TV, all dressed in suits. We are here to apologize. A recent incident allowed harm to come to first-year heroes, and we staff were ill-prepared. We take responsibility for any trauma caused by our negligence. It's our duty to train heroes, but also to protect heroes in training. Aizawa said with a bow. I'll take the first question. A reporter said from behind the camera. Since the beginning of the year, U.S. students have had four encounters with villains. This time, there were students who were gravely injured. How did you explain this to their families? And what are some of the specific steps you're taking to ensure their safety in the future? Zero clenched his fists. The media should know what U.S. basic position is since they didn't cancel the sports festival. They just want him to look bad. We will increase patrols around the school grounds and review security measures within the school. The safety of U.S. students is our main priority, make no mistake about it. Nezu said. The crowd started sneering and whispering. Zero was glad that he was too far up to hear the scorns from the people otherwise, he probably would have smacked them with a barrel of his sniper. You spoke about keeping the students safe, Eraserhead. But according to our information, you encouraged them to fight during the attack on the training camp, putting them in grave danger. What was your reasoning for this? His father partner leaned forward. I concluded that because we didn't know the full situation, 
Allowing them to use their quirks would help avoid the worst possible outcome. And what would that outcome be? Do you think victims and one kidnapped child is a win for you a high? Much like Aizawa, Zero hated the media. They were always asking questions like it was their sole priority to make the heroes look bad for the public. Putting words in their mouths and manipulating what they say. I assure you that things could have gone much more poorly. I feared every student would be tortured and killed in the end. It was Nezu who addressed the reporter next. Most of the victims were harmed by the gas attack. We've determined it to be the result of a poisonous quirk used by one of the villains. It's thanks to the quick actions of Miss Kendo and Mr. Tetsutetsu that injuries were kept to a bare minimum, as well as another student's quirk. Additionally, we're providing mental health counseling to every student. Though at the moment, we do not see any signs of serious psychological trauma. So you found a bright spot in this tragedy. We're relieved that an entire class of burgeoning heroes still has a future. Can you say the same thing for the abducted Katsuki Bakugu? He enrolled at your school with excellent marks and went on to win the sports festival. Before that, he survived the attack of a powerful sludge villain who eventually had to be taken down by All Might. The boy is obviously strong and heroic. On the other hand, the violence he displayed in the finals and his attitude at the awards ceremony both showed that he could not control his temper. What if this is the real reason the villains kidnapped him? What if they're brainwashing Bakugu right now, pulling him toward the path of evil? How can you sit there and tell us he still has a future? Aizawa stood up, seeming to have enough with this reporter who Zero could picture was smiling smugly off the camera. But instead of losing his composure, Aizawa bowed. As Katsuki Bakugu's teacher, I take full responsibility for not taming his violent behavior. However, his actions at the sports festival were born of his deep-seated convictions. He lifted his head, staring the reporter down. He's trying harder than anyone in his pursuit to become the top hero. If the villains think they have a chance with him, then they are grossly mistaken. I can guarantee you that much. The reporter sneered. That doesn't amount to real evidence though. I didn't ask you how you feel. I asked you if you had concrete information. We're doing our best with the intel we currently have available. I have no doubt the police will break this case very soon. We won't rest until our missing student is returned to Yua. Nezu said firmly. Zero smirked when no more questions came from the reporter. They were confident in their ability to find Katsuki just as much as he was. He stood from the ledge and stretched. He grasped his grappling hook and put his finger on the narrow tongue of the trigger, but didn't fire. His attention snapped down to where four poorly concealed UA students were running from the crowd. Zero raised his eyebrows and started jumping from rooftop to rooftop the darkness keeping him invisible. When they stopped to catch their bearings away from the civilians he jumped down behind them, still concealed in the shadows. They huddled close together, discussing more of whatever plan they were brewing. Zero's eyebrows furrowed. What are you four doing? They all jumped away quickly, getting into a fighting stance and Zero emerged from the shadows with a frown. They all relaxed and Kirishima stepped forward. Zero, we want to help too. We've been talking and have been trying to find you. With your help, we can definitely get Bakugo back. He figured that's what they were doing. Zero regarded the determined group of students with a mixture of acknowledgement and concern. Kirishima, Yayurazu, Todoroki, and Ida stood resolute, their eyes reflecting a shared determination to rescue their kidnapped friend. You're still students, Zero said his voice tinged with caution. This isn't a training exercise. It's a dangerous situation involving real villains. Kirishima stepped forward. His unwavering spirit was evident. We get that zero, but Bakugo is our friend. We can't just sit around doing nothing. Yayurazu chimed in, her voice steady. We might not be pros, but we're not helpless either. With your experience and our determination, we can increase our chances of finding Bakugo. Todoroki added, We can be an asset, not a liability. 
we've faced tough situations at UA, and we've come out stronger every time. Ida, the embodiment of order and resolve, spoke earnestly. Our quirks complement each other well, and we can strategize effectively. Let us help. Zha sighed, realizing the sincerity in their words. I appreciate your passion, but this is dangerous. Villains can be unpredictable, and I can't guarantee your safety. Kirishima grinned, undeterred. We're not asking for guarantees, just a chance to bring our friend back. While he appreciated their spirit, Zero still fought back. You're risking expulsion. The consequences can be severe. Kirishima shook his head. We've faced expulsion threats before. This is about more than rules. Zero knew Aizawa. While he was popular for expelling students, he always re-enrolled them the next day. This was different. Aizawa will not take this lightly. It's not just him you have to worry about. It's also Principal Nezu. I'm trying to help you. Go. Home. He grabbed his grappling hook, and when it wrapped around the edge of a building, he let it pull his body into the air and disappeared. It wasn't long after Zero left the students did he found the police and pro heroes gathering around a building, including All Might and Endeavor. Zero sighed. They found him. He whispered to himself and took Blackout from its protective case, kicking the stands up and setting it on the ledge a couple of buildings over. He lay on his stomach, lined up the barrel, and watched them through the stethoscope. They didn't do anything for a couple of minutes before All Might tensed and suddenly punched through the brick wall. The heroes strategically entered the building and immobilized the villains in seconds. Still, Zero waited. Everything was calm, their plan had worked, and it seemed that they never needed him. And for once, that made him very happy. He started to stand. Katsuki was going to be oh. No. Zero Nak snapped back to them. No longer were things calm. In seconds, chaos had erupted, and a group of Namu ripped themselves free of the weird metallic gray sludge. Gunshots were fired, quirks were being used, and All Might had fled the scene, like he was following someone. Katsuki was nowhere to be found. Zer didn't pursue him. He repositioned himself back on the roof of the building he was on, and whenever he got clear shots, he used a combination of real, explosive and paralysis bullets to stop the Namu from killing anyone. Only then when it looked like the heroes and police were back in control did Zetuk tuck Blackout back into its case and race towards Kamino Ward. Zero had told them to go home. They should have gone home. 